Mr. Mayor, you can start the meeting. All right. Great to see everybody on the Zoom platform again. And it is Monday, oh, it's not even Monday, it's Wednesday, June 3rd. Can't wait to get back to the Monday meetings. Uh, so I think we'll be having a motion coming up on that. And I just want to begin the gathering by acknowledging the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, many of whom continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the, the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. Acknowledging this reminds us of our great standard of living is directly related to the resources and friendship of our Indigenous people. As, as this is Indigenous People's Month here in Canada, uh, there's a lot to celebrate. And over the month, we're gonna be seeing stuff coming from our museum, from our libraries, but also from the community. And it's an important opportunity for us as a community to learn more about our Indigenous brothers and sisters, their history, their rich culture, and everything that they've contributed to the fabric of our community. And I have, do, do have a mayor's report that I would just briefly like to go through. It is somewhat lengthy, but I think considering the times, it's something that I'd just like to address a couple of the issues that are facing us as a community. I'd like to start by reflecting on the unrest and protests currently taking place across the United States following the brutal death of George Floyd at the hands of the Minneapolis Police Department. This has re reignited the need for communities to take dem demonstrated action to combat racism. We are not immune to racism and we see it in our city and on a day-to-day -day basis on social media. And I'm proud of the efforts of this council who established an anti-racism committee in 2018 comprised of those with lived experiences to help our city root out systematic racism and discrimination. They have been working on developing new policies, reviewing city procedures and examining ways for St. Catharines to push back at racism in many forms. Action will follow from this work of the committee. In addition to this much needed committee, we also have the Equity and Inclusion Committee and the LGBTQ2 Plus Committee guiding St. Catharines in becoming a strongly diverse and inclusive city that celebrates and supports those who have traditionally been marginalized. Now is the time for action and not simply for reflection. And as white man of privilege, I am listening. As a community leader, I also have a duty to act and I will call out injustices, hate and racism in our community. We need everyone to embrace this, to truly listen to those who have been oppressed, to commit to act against those who push hate and intolerance and to call out injustices as they happen. St. Catharines is a dynamic, diverse and compassionate community we can learn from what is happening around us. And by acting now, we can create a, a community built on diversity and equality for everyone. In addition to that, last Friday, there was a, a murder in our community, a domestic violence murder that took place on Friday. And this is, is something that as, as, a, as a community, uh, again, we can't look away from. And this is what's happening in a lot of communities across the country, not just because of the pandemic, but it's in the shadow of a pandemic and it's domestic violence. And so if there's people of the community that are looking for shelter, looking for help, Jillian's Place and the YWCA are two resources for you to reach out to. If you're looking to provide a donation, if you're looking to provide a, a voluntary assistance, uh, Jillian's Place and the YW are great places that would greatly need your assistance. So in light of what's happening in our community on many different fronts, we've got to make sure that we're supporting the agencies that are looking after the most vulnerable as well. This week, we also heard from the federal government about their contributions to the communities. And while I would like to acknowledge the federal gov government for providing the gas tax payment upfront in full, this is simply a very small step that needs to be followed by other measures. This is not new money and will not assist with non-recoverable losses municipalities are facing across the country. Since the beginning of the crisis, munic municipalities across Canada have kept run a running tally of the extra costs associated COVID-19. These costs are real and they're very difficult to manage. Later in the meeting, our CAO Shelley Kemnitz will provide her, CA, her COVID-19 update, nine, uh, update, nine, COVID update. You will hear that the work by our senior leadership and finance teams have determined the potential for a $10.5 million impact on the tax levy by the end of 2020. Without additional support, possible cost containment efforts could bring the funding shortfall down to 6.6 million, but this is attacking our financial resiliency and our stability. 
Council has been fiscally prudent with reserves and the infrastructure levy over the past several years, which will assist us, but those investments may not help long-term should we suffer a third or a second or third wave of COVID-19 or any other type of major emergency. Unfortunately, municipalities have very few levers for generating revenue. Without additional monetary support, we face some very difficult challenges. We're, we're, as, as a group of mayors, we're pushing very hard at both the provincial and federal governments to get them to understand that they need to provide the recovery, the relief recovery for us to get through this financial crisis. And beyond the, the side of recovery, I'm looking forward to today's discussion around this recover, city's recovery plan. Staff have worked very hard to create a moat roadmap for our community to recover that I believe will guide us forward towards a stronger, more resilient and sustainable future. I encourage our community to take the time to learn more about the plan. Tomorrow, city staff will be releasing detailed information on our public engagement platform, engagestc.ca, providing residents and business owners to review the proposed approach in more detail and to engage the city on its efforts as we move forward. And these are challenging times as which we all know, and you'll hear from our CAO about the difficult decisions that we have to make. In a perfect world, we would like, we would like to just open everything and, and have everything go back to the way it was but this is no longer a perfect world. So we're gonna to have to make some tough decisions. I also wanna to touch on a public health issue that has uh, greatly impacted the, the direction that COVID-19 is taking in our community. We heard from public health and from Pioneer Farms first that they had a significant outbreak at their facility. This is an unfortunate reminder that while we've had success in reducing COVID-19, there is still the potential to become infected. And when you look at how quickly it has spread through that community, that workplace, it's a clear indication that when it comes to containing COVID-19, it'll be difficult as we, mo as we, move, as we move to open up the, the economy even more. Public health is working closely with the ownership and, of, and staff of Pioneer to ensure the health and safety of those affected and members of our community as a whole, including closely monitoring and increased cleaning and disinfection. So, these are examples of what could happen as our economy starts to open. And we just wanna make sure that we're looking after all the people in our community and making sure that their, their best interests are being taken, uh, taken into consideration. Um, this also touches on the people who are gathering that took place at Sunset Beach. This is a reminder that when you gather in large numbers, the infection rate can happen quickly. And so the best, the best way to combat this is reduce our, our contact rate, keep our, phys our, our hygiene, keep our, 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 how we're looking after ourselves to the highest standards and making sure that we're following public health directives. Just wanna say congratulations to the team that opened up the St. Catharines Market, Phil Christie, Lori Mambella, Mambella uh, Briar Wilson, the entire team has done an outstanding job to open up a new format, new format farm, um, farmer's market with precautionary measures in place. I saw it firsthand as did a number of counselors, how well it operated. So I just want to say congratulations to the team there. As well, I want to say congratulations to Shelly Locke for her submission of Hope Floated. And she is this year's winner of the Mayor's Poetry Challenge. And you could visit, you could read the poem on my website, mayor.mayorsaintcatharines.ca. And I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to submit the poems about uh, what it's taking to be together. Also announcing that the Royal Canadian Henley Regatta is canceled this year. This is the 139th year of the end of the regatta and it's only been suspended twice, uh, only two other times in 1916 to 1918. And this was because of all the young men who were involved in World War I. So this is a difficult decision by the Royal Canadian Henley Joint Commission. And it does have an impact on our community, but they're doing it in the best interest of the athletes, the volunteers and our community as well. And we know that they will come back even stronger next year after we get through this. Also want to say uh, to Councillor Cisco and his team of volunteers, they're doing, there's a grocery giveaway taking place on Friday, June 5th at noon at Market Square. Physical distancing and safety guidelines are in, in place. And those who are coming for this free grocery giveaway, please wear a mask or have a face covering as well. And I want to thank the generous donator, uh, um, donor who has come forward in our community. As well, this is Pride Month and Pride Niagara has done an amazing job of creating a virtual lineup, lineup of events this year to continue to recognize and celebrate Pride Week here at Niagara. We had a virtual flag raising at, at St. Catherine City Hall. They've taken place throughout the region. Check out their social media channels for more information. Congratulations to Pride Niagara on 10 years in our community and to Kevin and Enzo, the founders of Pride Niagara. They have helped to create an inclusive community and we celebrate with them 
their diversity and our diversity with them in it. Um, in terms of seniors month, we kicked off seniors month. And so June is senior month, senior month, seniors month in our community. And uh, I was a special, special guest on the seniors centers without walls, which is being uh, put on by the community centers here in, in, in St. Catharines. They've done a wonderful job of keeping connected with the seniors in our community. <clears throat> and I've touched on um, Indigenous History Month. I'm gonna be uh, talking with uh, Sean Vanderclis from One Dish, One Mic uh, next Wednesday for Instagram Live to talk about National Indigenous Peoples Day on June 21st. This week is Accessib Accessibility Week an opportunity to celebrate the valuable contribution of Canadians with disabilities, recognizing their efforts of individuals, communities, and workplaces that are actively working to promote, to remove barriers and to promote accessibility and inclusivity. And I'm proud of the work that our accessibility advisory committee has done in the city of St. Catharines from the accessibility plan to all the new, all the new enhancements that we have, not just here in our buildings, but also to things like our place, our play, play areas for kids as well. Um, this is also, uh, ALS Awareness Month. And so I just wanna, to, the, to those who are raising funds for ALS, I wanna say thank you. It is a very terrible disease in our community. And it's uh, the annual walk is always one that a number of counselors have attended. So if there's ways to donate, go to ALS Canada and make your donation there as well. And this is a special shout out to Councillor Sorrento and all the folks from Club Roma. And uh, today, the, June is the month to celebrate all things Italian, Ita Italian Canadian or Canadian Italian. In 2018, the Ontario Register passed a bill to officially declare June Italian Heritage Month. And so we'd be eating a lot of um, great Italian food at Club Roma this month if it wasn't for COVID-19. So I just wanna say thank you to uh, our Italian community for making us a, a, for being a part of our rich culture as well. So with that, I'm gonna look to the adoption of the agenda. I apologize for the, the long mayor's report, but we had a lot to get through and I'll turn it to the clerk for any amendments. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The following items of additional correspondence have been placed in Council Sugar Sink folder. AMO watch file from May 28, 2020. A letter to St. Catharines Council from the city's cultural sector. The following are amendments to the agenda. Item 2.2 was removed from the agenda and incorporated into item 3.1. That's COVID update report for June 3rd. General Committee Agenda 3.1, Item 3.1, the first clause of the recommendation has been amended to include the endorsement of the Pandemic Recovery Strategy from Economic Development and Tourism Services, attached as Appendix 2 to your report. An additional reason to go in camera has been added, which is advice that is su subject to solicitor client privilege, including uh, communications necessary for that purpose regarding General Agenda Item 2.4, Sub Item 8, Council correspondence, a letter from the Coalition for a Better St. Catharines regarding the former General Motors lands. And that's all I have. Okay, any amendments to the to the agenda? Yes. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Garcia, yes. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I have a, a question uh, on the agenda that I apologize I did not send to the clerk earlier because I just uh, uh, realized this. Uh, when I look at the agenda at uh, the last meeting, uh, Councillor Miller, Miller made a motion about cul de sacs, and it was decided we he had to put it in as a notice of motion. So we voted on it as a notice of motion, but I noticed that motion is not on the agenda, and even the minutes don't reflect that that, can, that, that happened. So I would like to know why that isn't on the agenda unless Councillor Miller withdrew it. So I'll go to the clerk first because I think there was stuff that happened around that, Councillor Garcia. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, what I have on the agenda was pulled from the minutes of, um, I'm sorry, from the minutes from the Budget Standing Committee. Um, I believe Councillor Miller was, in my, I thought Councillor Miller was going to be bringing something up here when that came forward. I don't have it. I didn't have anything in writing to add to that. Sorry. I see Councillor Miller's hand up. I, sorry, I have my hand up about uh, something else I'd pulled. I guess uh, my understanding was, I guess it was sort of rolled into what the Budget Standing Committee discussed. And since we'd be talking about 
I assume we would, because I, that's why I think I'd asked if, if somebody had pulled the, that part of the budget standing committee, I, to, to me, I was satisfied with that, I suppose. Okay, thank you, Councillor Miller. Councillor Garcia. Another... Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And so through you to the clerk, so are we saying that, uh, that that notice of motion we approved is just not on the agenda? Because as I said, it's not even on the minutes, even if there is something on the budget committee that to me, that's a different matter than something that was supposed to be on the agenda as a motion. So um, we don't approve notices of motion. They're just placed on the agenda so that for the next meeting, council will have given the notice for council to discuss it, but it's not a nay, it's not a yay or nay whether or not to include that on there as part of the agenda. And I'll look to the clerk for clarification. Agree, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. We didn't have anything in writing, just notice that this was gonna be brought up at this meeting and I assumed it was going to be tied in or discussed at that time. So just to clarify, we don't vote on notices of motion, Councillor Garcia, because if we started doing that, we could potentially vote down a notice of motion that couldn't then come to the floor. So procedurally, we don't, it's never been done, nor would we do that. That's correct. Okay, Councillor Miller. Yeah, just uh, one, I'm excited to never say the word call the sec again after today, but I think, I'd ask for 2.4 uh, number three to be pulled with a uh, with an alternative recommendation or motion. Yeah, so that's been lifted. It has. Oh, okay, there. perfect. Yeah, that's on 2.4. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there anything else that needs to be changed on the agenda? Councillor Williamson, are you good? Did you wave there? Uh, I can't, I don't have the ability to unmute you, sorry. Evan, is there a way that you can help here or no? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, 2.1, the uh, naming of the Lakeside Park Pavilion from consent to discussion. Okay. As discussed, thank you. Councillor Harris. I just, I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time, but Councillor Kushner and I were going to bring a notice of motion about the uh, <clears throat> South Drive Highland reconstruction. And we might be asking to waive the rules too. It's about sidewalk uh, deletion from the scope of work. Okay, that'll come up under notice of motion. Okay. Okay, thank you. And then uh, Councillor Littleton, you have your hand up. It was just to make sure that that item was pulled. That's all. Okay, thank you. Okay, seeing no other hands up, thank you very much for that. Uh, I have uh, Councillor Littleton moving the agenda. So moved. And seconded by Councillor Miller. Agreed. Okay, thank you. And all in favor? I see everyone's hands. Anyone opposed? I don't think so. That's carried. Thank you very much. Adoption of the minutes. We have a motion that council adopt the minutes of the meeting of council held on Wednesday, May 20th, 2020. That council adopt the minutes of the general committee meeting held on Wednesday, May 2020. And moving this is Deputy Mayor Dodge. So move, Mr. Mayor. And seconder, I have Councillor Phillips. Yes. And thank you for that, Councillor Phillips. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay, thank you very much. Carried. Okay, we will now resolve into general committee and the following items have been requested to be removed. And we have 2.3, which is the budget standing committee report and uh, sub item 10.2, call the sack, grass cutting policy by Councillor Littleton, 2.4, Councillor Cor Correspondence, sub item three, resolution from the city of Kitchener regarding universal basic income, Councillor Miller, 2.4, Council Correspondence, sub item eight, coalition for better St. Catharines, reformer General Motors land, Councillor Miller, and then item 2.1, Lakeside Park Pavilion naming, Councillor Williamson. And with that, uh, motion to move reports on consent. Again, we have Councillor Phillips moving that. I want to thank Councillor Phillips for that. So moved. 
Thank you. And I'll look to the clerk to call the question. For you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Phillips. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor Littleton? Yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. Councillor Porter? Councillor Porter? Oops. Yes, sorry. Councillor Cisco? Yes. Councillor Sorrento? Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. And Mayor Senzik? Yes. And that's carried unanimously. Okay, so now we move into general committee and we're first up 3.1. It's uh, our CAO Shelley Chemnitz and Deputy CAO David Oaks will provide an overview of COVID-19 update report. And I'll pass it over to CAO Chemnitz. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon, everyone. Today's discussion agenda includes the fifth update to council regarding city services and activities during the COVID-19 pandemic. I would consider this report to be the most significant to date. The focus continues to be strongly on recovery. It is, however, still only one report of many. We do anticipate that many more will follow. While the past weeks have brought clarity to certain aspects of this pandemic, there is much uncertainty that remains. As a result, while this report does contain much detail, both in activity and financial forecasts, we do still emphasize that all is subject to provincial guidelines and health authority advice. It includes the city's framework for recovery as is shown in appendices one and two. Staff and the control group and recovery teams have worked hard to put our vision together. It's been challenging to bring all the work together and convey it in our report today. It took a small army and I would like to thank all our staff for that up front. They did an excellent job working together. Dave Oaks and I would like to take a bit of time in advance of council's discussion of the report to highlight for the council and public the decision-making process we have undertaken in the last month. Consistent with our work throughout this pandemic, we work always with our control group objectives front of mind. The report today contains the recovery framework and strategies in keeping with those objectives. In addition, we're now working with three very specific considerations, safety, feasibility, and community, when making the very specific decisions as to which municipal services we will bring back online, how we will do it, and when. To start us off, a familiar slide depicting the three stages of province's framework for reopening. In April, the provincial government announced a framework for recovery designed to guide the province to financial and economic recovery from COVID-19. When released on April 27, the province indicated that each stage would be monitored for two to four weeks. As we progressed through the remainder of April and then the month of May, there were numerous announcements and legislation changes released. Each release gives us a larger window into the specifics of recovery. But uh, certainty, certainly not everything is clear yet, and it's unlikely to be until we're actually within each stage. So we know three stages are anticipated. We don't know for sure the dates on which we'll transition through the stages, and we only have broad parameters of what will open in each. As we progress through, more workplaces and outdoor spaces will be allowed to open and public gathering sizes will increase. Despite this uncertainty, we do need to plan ahead. We need to be prepared in advance for the announcements to come. We have done that, presented this in, and presented that in, this, in our report today. To effectively plan, we did need to make assumptions as to the dates of each stage. Moving forward, staff anticipate the province will move forward with stage two sometime in mid to late June or July, which would loosen restrictions on businesses and gatherings further, and stage three sometime in August, which would allow all workplaces to open with restrictions. And so we do emphasize that as those timelines, should those timelines change or be different from what we've assumed, all of the numbers and the openings and the the specifics in the report would change accordingly. And finance staff has worked hard to ensure that we have flexible modeling financially so that we can 
roll those numbers forward or back depending on the openings. Um, it is the general framework that we're looking here for council to endorse. Based on these assumptions, the city has developed a framework for recovery with four stages that are each defined by, defined by individual characteristics. Staff have aligned these stages to the provincial recovery framework where possible and have included estimated time frames, frames for when each stage might be progressed to. The stages are depicted on this slide. In stage one current, you see basic amenities that are currently open. During July and August, the assumed time frame in which we'll move to stage two, with safety protocols in place, staff are recommending the various amenities listed there open. As we move from summer to fall, we anticipate recommending stage three amenities would open. It seems simple and straightforward. However, by showing this slide here, we've really skipped to the end. What we would like to discuss further are the considerations and analysis that brought us to these recommendations. Thanks, Shirley. Sorry, having a little technical issue here. Um, thank you, sorry. Um, so what we had talked about in previous meetings and it's listed in the report um, was basically this slide reflects the three main points that our team has used when making our assessment of what service functions or buildings we will recommend for opening um, throughout the various stages within the recovery plan. And these, these have been critical and I, and I really want to make a point that our entire staff team across all departments have used this criteria to evaluate hundreds of services, functions, and building considerations. And it's really been uh, a testament to our, to our staff and to our team on how we were uh, able to go through that, that plan. Specifically, when we talk through safety, um, we speak to can we deliver the service safely and maintain safety, um, the feasibility, what resources are necessary to deliver in a fiscally responsible way. And then finally, the balance, and this is where we really need to target some of the, the recommendations that we put forward on, are these services utilizing our staff appropriately? Are we able, do we have the ability to bring staff in to, uh, to continue the services, uh, whether it's our seasonal casual employees, full-time or students? And then finally, are there other partners in the community that provide similar services? So these, these three considerations really provided that framework for providing the, the various uh, recommendations within the, within the report. Moving to the next slide, um, this specifically gives you an example of how these um, consideration, considerations have been applied to various activities. And I'll just briefly go through uh, the carousel as, as one example. So if you look at the, the first point being, can we make it safe? Um, the challenge we have with a carousel is you have a very confined space with a lot of um, points of contact being the animals, the, the any, anything that people have to uh, touch and hold on to when riding the carousel. Um, there's an associated cost when you factor in the second point of how do you maintain the, the sanitation, the disinfecting, um, the extra cleaning that would be required and the ability to manage the number of people within that confined space. So you factor the first consideration with the second, um, it, it makes it very difficult for, for the facility in and of itself to, to open in, in 2020. So that was uh, the reasoning why this would show uh, not opening the carousel for, for the 2020 year. I'll move on to the next slide. And it just gives you an example of the um, safety and feasibility. So when we look at the various functions, the various services, the buildings, um, there are a lot of um, elements that um, our facility staff, our finance staff, our operation staff um, across the corporation had to take into consideration when, when looking at um, whether it be servicing uh, the needs of our employees to keep them safe, servicing the needs of the public to keep the public safe as well, 
while also balancing the reality of supply shortages and physical barriers that may or may not be required. Again, this, uh, the, the balance of staffing and the ability for us to bring staff on, is another factor which uh, would, would play into the, uh, to this criteria. Um, so basically, as we, as we look to make services and facilities safe for both staff and the public, we have to balance a variety of factors. And, and that was a critical element into the decision-making matrix as well. In terms of the, uh, sorry, that, over to you, Shelley. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Uh, with this analysis now extending further, staff have worked through the related financial investment required to bring us from the current service level through the coming to future stages and beyond into next year. Our forecast timeframe in this report has appropriately been adjusted to the end of 2020. And when we combine the extended timeframe with the increased opening of amenities, the financial impact has increased significantly. Uh, the tax levy gap has now reached $10.5 million. As you see on the graph there, the gap is represented by the difference between the two green columns. Uh, middle and uh, far right. So as we get into um, the mitigation measures and this slide really starts to illustrate how the decisions that we make today have implications on future years. The, the efforts of reducing our staffing and service levels are being used to reduce the potential deficit, which in turn has implications on our future year budgets. As we're able to reduce our deficit through these measures, along with needed support from the provincial and federal governments, this ripple effect can be reduced. And as we balance what we need to consider for 2020, um, what we really need to take into, into factor as well is how is that going to translate into future year budgets and future year sustainability for the services that, that we currently offer. The next slide illustrates um, how when we start to bring back services and facilities back online tied into the various phases within the plan um, really highlights and starts to um, showcase the associated financial uh, accumulation um, which adds pressures to the overall year-end financial position within the municipality. So while we recognize these costs were included within the 2020 operating budget, the massive losses that we've seen in revenues associated with the pandemic have required us as a corporation to be able to manage our expenses across the, the various areas. So um, the mitigation efforts that we put in place as we start to bring services back online, reduce those, those expenses. So um, basically what we're saying here is as we start to bring services back online, the the net position of the city can change from a positive to a, to a net deficit. And we have to manage that, that process as we go forward. So communication is key. We've seen the volume of information that has come, information and disinformation from both sides that uh, we have experienced in this emergency. Communication is always key for us at the city with our uh, our stakeholders, but in this time, it has been even more uh, important. And as the province and city continue to ease restrictions on social distancing and bring services and facilities back online, the communications division continues to stress the importance of social distancing and the positive impact it has on reducing the spread. We saw what happened in Toronto and at Sunset Beach. Communications continues to adapt messaging around the nice weather that we'll now be experiencing and any new activities that result as that come as a result of that. The more the community works with us, the quicker we can return to our new normal. Bylaw enforcement, um, as you've heard, has moved from an education perspective to both education and ticketing. As of now, we have not issued tickets as we are experiencing good compliance when we need to uh, approach our, um, our residents and our, our businesses. But the incident at Sunset Beach has definitely shown us that a stricter stance needs to be taken and we need to need to be ready to employ one. Okay, what we'd like council and the community to take away today is that this pandemic has had a large impact on our community, our staff and our financial health as a city. 
The pandemic has not only attacked physical health of our community, the results are that our financial resiliency and sustainability are now being challenged. We've mitigated that impact where we can as we reduced operations. We've presented recommendations today for recovery for a community and the recommendations present a significant investment of our resources. The former treasurer in me wants to say we can't afford it, but I and all of our leadership team recognize that's not an option for us. We have to plan to recover and we have to be ready when the province gives us okay to implement that recovery. The community needs the amenities that we provide, provided we can deliver them safely. The problem is provincial and federal funding to help us through has not yet arrived. We need to plan, but don't know yet if there will be any sharing of our burden. This means we need to be very responsible in where we choose to invest our resources and responsible in planning how we could possibly fund the investment. I wanna be clear, none of the options we presented in the report as funding options are good solutions to our finances. They're just the ones that we have right now. They involve using our reserves, reducing infrastructure funding and increasing debt. For a city that has a significant infrastructure deficit, underfunded reserves, and is actively seeking to manage debt, this is a significant and serious difficulty. Using these options will both reduce our resilience should another significant wave of the pandemic occur and challenge our fiscal sustainability advances that we have worked hard to achieve over the last decade. The funding options we have presented are our worst case scenario. The ones we will use should federal and provincial funding not be available. We need to continue to advocate for the funding. It is critical to our future. Thank you, that concludes our presentation. All right, I wanna thank our CAO, uh, Shelley Kemnitz and Deputy CAO Dave, uh, David Oaks for a very thorough presentation. And, and there's gonna be a lot of discussion around this here today, but I, I, just wanna, I just wanna start by saying that a lot of work has been put out and I wanna echo what, uh, what the CAO has talked about. There's a lot of staff that have put in their time behind this. And from a council's perspective, uh, be mindful of there will be a second wave. And you know, we have to learn from history and history has taught us that there will be a second wave. To the extent of it, no one knows, but in the event of a second wave and when it happens, not an if, but when it happens, what is the mitigating impact gonna be on our community? So these are tough decisions that we're gonna have to make today. And in making those, uh, we've got to be able to, on the other side of COVID-19 and when our community is back up and running, we've got to make sure that we've done everything we've can to ensure that the future stability of the, the community is intact. And I think that's what you're hearing from the CAO is that the decisions that we make today, we're not even in the fall yet. Uh, so, you know, we've got two major facilities that we don't know if will, the lights will go on until next year. Um, significant revenue shortfalls there. So we just got to balance that. And I, I'm looking forward to a very thorough discussion and providing council, if I can ask what council could do today is provide staff with the direction that you as a group think we need to go on. And they need that direction because this recovery plan is going to be critical to the implementation of the strategies that they've outlined. So we have to give them the confidence today that they can go forward in that direction. And with all the, the input, um, I'm confident that our team can do that. So I have um, Councillor Sorrento has got his hand up. I got Councillor Garcia. So just keep putting your hands up and we'll go from there. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to uh, CAO, just a, just a couple of very specific questions. Um, I'm just wondering why it would cost over a million dollars to reopen the cemetery. Uh, it's on page 35 or 36. So um, if you could just speak to that, because I know a lot of people have been going out there and um, I, I was pretty shocked to see it at, you know, a million dollars to reopen it. So if you can just give us a, a comment on that, please, uh, CEO Chemnitz. Thank you, Councillor. We're going to, uh, to ensure we have clarity. Uh, we've, we've divvied up responses to the questions today. So anytime it hits dollars, Christine Douglas will start and if there's operational or how are we going to do questions, then we'll cycle through to the various directors. 
Uh, thank you, uh, CAO Chemnitz, and through you, Mr. Mayor, um, with regards to the operations of the, the cemetery, um, in the analysis that we have done with regards to looking at all of the facilities reopening, we have looked at um, not only the expenses to operate the facility, but also the revenues. And with uh, regards to the cemetery, um, a significant um, decrease is expected with regards to the revenues that we um, are expecting to collect for the cemetery. Therefore, that is contributing um, to the majority of the um, million dollar. We're expecting a decline of a, a approximately um, half, 50% of our revenues in the, in the cemeteries. Um, also to that, there is also the additional costs with regards to the administration building, the additional cleaning costs and sanitation that is required in that facility to, uh, to make it safe um, for that facility to be reopened. So the combination of those two items um, are contributing to that, um, that cost. Okay, that's great. I'm going to withdraw my second question, Mr. Mayor, and there's a point that you made that uh, you asked uh, Council to give direction to staff, so I'm, I'm happy with what staff is doing right now. I know that we're going to get into details as we move forward. Um, just keep one thing in mind, if we can lock in some long-term debt right now at a very, very low rate, perhaps maybe in five or six years when interest rates go back up again, maybe we can sell that debt on the market as a profit. But uh, I'm going to keep my remarks short, Mr. Mayor, because I know uh, a lot of my colleagues have lots to say, and I'm sure they're going to answer uh, questions that I have as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I be heard right now? I just want to make sure. Okay, good. Um, I, just putting the, the motion on the floor, Mr. Mayor, as it's presented with one amendment, and I'm hoping Evan can put it up on the screen. It was, it was forwarded uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, with respect to uh, the second clause of the recommendation where it says that staff explore temporary street closures to support business and economic recovery efforts, uh, that underneath that, the council delegates staff authority to initiate, collaborate, and oversee a plan for a series of municipally owned road and lane closures, including but not limited to St. Paul Street, to create more public space for pedestrians and businesses in the downtown core, providing an opportunity for businesses to fulfill any new provincial safety guidelines and for residents to dine and shop local in a safe way. Um, and I will, uh, I will reserve my right to speak to the end, uh, but I wanted to make sure that I drew attention to that particular part as that was the one amendment that I was making to the motion that was uh, in the agenda. As a council, will we, thank you, Councillor Cisco. As a council, what we'll do, so this is a very big topic. Uh, there are a number of, of recommendations made by staff and what I'm going to ask is we could do two things. We can, you can ask questions. And then if you have an amendment, you can say, I'm, I want to save my amendment until we get to the, the final voting part. Or you can put the amendment on the table. We won't vote on it, but you can put an amendment on the table and, the, um, and Evan will collect it. So we're going to try and do this in a very concerted way where I know there's questions that you're going to have of the report. But if you do also have an amendment, you can make mention of the amendment, but we're not going to vote on it at that time. We're going to wait until the end to go through uh, so we don't get lost in amendments and everything else. OK, that's going to be the best way to do this. So thank you, Councillor Cisco, Councillor Garcia. I'm, I'll be doing I'll be going through the roll. So Councillor Garcia, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have a number of questions on that report, but first of all, I would like to uh, to thank uh, the recovery team very much for putting such a thorough um, assessment and recommendation together. I know these take a lot of time and a lot of thought, so much appreciated. So one question is on the golf course status, and I see that the report says that uh, it would cost approximately 380000 to reopen it, so therefore recommending we don't. So my question is somewhat similar to the Council of Sorrentos on the, uh, the cemetery. Um, I'm not sure I understand why it would cost so much. And also, 
is there a way that some use of the golf course can be provided because I get a lot of questions about it without um, hiring a lot of staff or uh, you know uh, some kind of part-time use or minimal use or something so some people can use it so test okay so what's so is that that's for it's not for counselor Sorrento this is for staff correct yes okay who wants to take it thank you Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I will uh, start with regards to details with regards to the cost. So um, staff have made a number of assumptions with regards to all of the, the city um, facilities and also um, which includes the uh, municipal golf course. So um, there are costs associated uh, with opening up uh, the golf course in making it safe. Um, that means uh, there needs to be protective barrier um, installed in, in the clubhouse area, um, as well as the frequency of, of cleaning um, the washrooms, which um, there's additional costs associated with that. In addition, there, um, there is the utility cost, which is um, largely the, you know, the, the watering cost, um, as well as the supplies to um, maintain um, the course itself and um, insurance and uh, fuel related to those operations as well. And then we have our staffing costs to um, look after the course. So those are the um, costs that um, are included as uh, in the 381,000 that is included in the report. I will now um, pass it to uh, Director Smith with regards to the operations. Thank you. I'm sorry, I missed the question. Could you please repeat the question, Councillor? Uh, yes, uh, Director Smith. My question was for you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the, the amount that I saw, and maybe I misread it, uh, she said 600 and some. I read 380,000 to reopen it, which I <clears throat> thought was a lot already. But uh, my question was, assuming we have to spend those funds to reopen it, is there a way that uh, there could be some partial uh, reopening that would not cost so much and uh, would satisfy so many residents that uh, have that uh, golf course as their primary uh, um, recreation and uh, and they can't afford the other courses. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, the potential for cost savings by reducing the, either the number of holes or the hours of operation, uh, there would be some obviously, but they would be minimal um, because it's the use of the facility and the safety measures that we put in place and the extended cleaning. So it doesn't really matter if they're going over nine holes or 18 holes, we still have to clean all the washrooms on a more frequent basis and, and those things. Where there may be potentially some savings um, uh, would be the grass cutting if we shut down some of the holes because we could we wouldn't cut it to the same level that we would cut active playing areas um, but again I, that that savings would be um, marginal and, and it would take some time to actually calculate what they would be okay <clears throat> thank you director smith uh, I, uh, it, I people are going to be frustrated but i understand uh, my next question is to the director, uh, Director Christie, about reducing the skip funding. Um, a very good assessment. I understand what he's recommending, and that uh, uh, we will continue to support sustaining programs. It's just that we won't uh, be approving new ones necessarily. Um, I'm reluctant to say okay to that. That's near and dear to my heart, but I, I understand we need to uh, to save money. Uh, so my question is, uh, I think it was the CAO who said communication is key, and that's what I want to ask Director Christie. Uh, how will we notify the arts community of this decision and what the impact is? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the, um, our team has been in contact with the arts and, arts and culture community. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, we've, we've been in touch with the sustaining clients as well as the culture days clients. So they are well aware of uh, the potential of this, um, especially after the report was actually on the previous council's agenda, they had a chance to review it then. And then this uh, amended version is now before you. 
So they are aware of the, uh, of the, the realities that the city is facing. They're also aware of, uh, they've reminded us that the 2020 skip budget, uh, which was approved by council late last year, was supposed to mark an increase, a significant increase over the previous year. Um, so we have been in touch with them, Councillor. Um, I admittedly, not all of them, um, because some of them are smaller organizations. They haven't applied yet. They haven't reached out to us, so we haven't reached out to them. But we have been in touch with most of them. Okay, thank you very much. Hopefully, if we approve this, that will be uh, covered in the media so other people can read it. Um, next question, I guess, to the treasurer, Mr. Mayor, through you. Uh, I know we're proposing that one way of funding the deficit would be uh, using research, including the uh, uh, civic project fund. And I just wanted to ask, uh, what would the balance be left uh, if we approve uh, taking the money that's suggested? Thank you, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. With regard to the balance of the Civic Project uh, Fund Reserve, at the end of 2019, it was um, approximately 4.3 million was uncommitted. And based on our current position, um, we would need uh, slightly over a um, million dollars to um, go towards um, mitigating the projected uh, 2020 year end deficit. So therefore that would uh, reduce the Civic Project um, balance to um, just um, slightly over $3 million. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my last question, Mr. Mayor, I think is also through you to the treasurer. Uh, I understand that one of the recommendations is to uh, increase debt, and that was mentioned already, interest rates are low, so I guess that's a, uh, a relatively um, simple solution to part of it. Uh, my concern is uh, they're asking that we approve moving that ratio uh, up to potentially 10%. So, and that in the future, we may have to go to 15%. I, I would have real trouble with a 15%, but I want to make clear or clarify by approving the current recommendation, we are not necessarily approving going to the 15% of operating, are we? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the report is uh, not recommending to go up to the 15% uh, of total um, expenditures at this time. Um, the report was trying to bring forward to Council's attention that as we are moving through this, we um, are seeing that we need to look at options that are available to the city. Um, and one of the ways that we are able to provide relief for less burden on the tax levy is with regards to using less, um, less tax levy dollars to support our capital program. However, then we have to find another way to fund the capital program and therefore we're looking towards debt. Also looking forward at um, you know, what we're facing with regards to our 2021 then uh, likely into our 2022 budget as well as we see our um, revenue levels, our non-tax revenues are likely to um, decrease. In particular, we see a decline, um, have seen three drops in the interest rate um, uh, the Bank of Canada so far this year. So that impacts our, our revenue. Um, so therefore, we need to also reduce our um, expenses if we're going to maintain um, a zero or close to zero percent percent tax increase. So therefore, if our expenditures are going to be declining, it is going to be extremely challenging for us as we move forward to be able to continue to provide, um, you know, and address our capital um, infrastructure deficit without looking at potentially increasing that debt um, that debt servicing costs as a percentage of our operating expenditures. So we wanted to bring that forward to council's attention because it does factor significantly into our development of our 2021 and uh, you know four-year forecasts of capital budgets. And um, because if we're not receiving some support to look at increasing it, not suggesting that we need to to or should be going to the 15%, but we need some flexibility with that 10%, um, especially in the next coming years, so that we're able to balance all of the services and needs of the municipality. 
Thank you. So if I understand correctly, uh, uh, Madam Treasurer, uh, we're approving the 10%. And then if we need to go higher than that, that will be a decision that will come to council at a future date with the 2021 budget. Uh, thank you through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to the councillor. The current strategy that the city has with regards to debt is the 10%. So that already exists. And this additional debt that would be approved here would be within that. Um, so that uh, we're not approving that 10%. We already have that. Um, it will come with uh, with the capital budget, the increase in uh, the debt percentage of revenues um, for, for approval. But um, just want to bring that forward to council's attention at this time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Garcia. I have Councillor Porter and then Councillor Phillips, Councillor Littleton, Councillor Townsend and Councillor Dodge. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question for staff and I also have um, an amendment. So I would like to start with a question and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, the Deputy CAO, I have a question uh, about the Meridian Center. I understand that um, they've reduced their staff uh, by 60% and they're, they've reduced their cost by 35%, but they, have yet, they haven't yet applied for the Canadian Emergency Wage Subsidy, but they're going to. Um, I'm just wondering if, you believe there's a possibility that they can um, further reduce their costs and that we can have another conversation about their budget um, after they get approval, uh, if they get approval for the wage subsidy. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, that's exactly what we're doing. So what we've presented in, in the recovery plan and in, in the document is sort of that worst case scenario. Um, we have been talking with ASM. We do understand that they, they are applying for the wage subsidy. So if that comes on, the number reduces. And the, uh, the mechanism we put in place within the recommendation was we would look at it on a month by month basis. So as they restate their, their budget or as new, new opportunities come forward or present themselves to the Meridian Center, that number will reduce. So we've essentially shown you the, the worst case scenario with the intent to mitigate that on a go-forward basis. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and Mr. Mayor, is it okay if I put the amendment on the floor right now? Yeah, I, I think what we'll do, we'll just, we won't discuss the amendment that you'll put on the floor, we'll wait until, uh, but you could put an amendment on the floor. Okay, I did the, send it to staff. Um, I believe there some other counselors have been discussing this with me as well. Um, that the skip budget be maintained at the budgeted 2020 level and that the staff report back uh, by the next meeting on the idea of a program to create a temporary COVID fund for music, arts and culture act, cultural activities that support downtown revitalization and enhance public life during the recovery um, and that staff be directed to temporar temporarily revise skip policies to allow this initiative to proceed. Um, so I don't believe we'd have all the answers to this today, um, but I do think it's important to maintain um, cultural funding. A lot of us have turned to arts and culture online and um, a lot of musicians have turned online um, during this time when we're home alone isolated and they've seen a significant reduction in their income. Obviously they, they, they're not playing at gigs, um, but they're, they're still entertaining us. And as we, move forward with trying to bring people back towards our downtown. If the Meridian Center and the Performing Arts Center are not open, we need to create um, some activity and some kind of events uh, for people to return safely in the downtown um, and animate the public space. And I know that some skip projects might not be able to be fulfilled. Um, I don't know which ones are carrying on and which ones aren't. I'm hoping staff can report back on how some of, some skip funds can be diverted to create a temporary fund so that we can hire um, artists and musicians to maybe play outside uh, in patios and, and to animate public spaces um, and patios in our downtown. Um, restaurants and businesses are struggling um, to hang on in the downtown. Um, and my fear is um, if we don't come up with some innovative programs 
uh, to bring life back to the downtown, uh, they're going to start to close. So thank you very much. And I want to thank staff for this very excellent and thorough report um, that I think really helps explain the situation we are in to the public. Thank you, Councillor Porter. Uh, Councillor Cisco, uh, since you moved the staff um, recommendation onto the floor, uh, can you accept this as an amendment? As a friendly amendment? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so to Evan, can you work with that? <clears throat> Just because this is a staff, um, so Councillor Cisco did obviously not write this motion. This is a staff motion. So if we accept the amendment in terms of in, if yes, if we're friendly, then we can at least change that part of it and then still have a discussion when we get to the accepting of the amendments or not. Okay, thanks, Councillor Porter. And I move on to, I think I said Councillor Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in regards to the golf course questions, um, it indicated that it's gonna cost approximately $380,000 for the re remainder of the year to run it. Um, what is the projected revenue uh, on the golf course for that period of time, would that be subtracted from the 380,000 or has that already been taken into account? Thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. The projected revenues for the remainder of uh, the year are approximately $75,000. That is based on 2019 actuals and that has been already reduced off of the amount shown in the report of the 381,000. Okay. Um, thank you. In uh, given the fact of given the situation, the golf courses around right now are are very full. Having played at Brockland on the weekend with my grandson, uh, the place was packed, and uh, I think uh, um, people are really looking for something to do. And I've had I've had phone calls from residents wondering when it was going to open. And, uh, I think it was at the Budget Standing Committee, we did talk about it opening on the 1st of July, and that obviously since it's changed. Um, to uh, Director Smith, in order to um, maintain the golf course, you're not just going to let it go through fallow. I mean, the greens have to be maintained, the, the fairways have to be cut, trimmed, whatever, uh, in order to open it for next year, which, by the way, wasn't indicated in stage four of the uh, of the initial uh, presentation uh, but anyways um, how much do you figure it's going to cost just to maintain it so that we can run it next year because if you don't it's going to go to fallow and you're never you'll never bring it back uh, through you mr mayor we already have two staff members assigned there that are doing that maintenance now they're doing the minimum maintenance to um to keep it uh, so we don't lose it and go to fallow. The cost that's in the um, that's in this report is to increase to bring it back to full usage. So it's it's already incorporated in our current staffing levels. So is that part of the three hundred eighty thousand dollars also? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, that that that's uh, that's not included in three hundred eighty thousand, if I'm correct it's already being accounted for in the budget that we're in our operating budget as we go forward. The 380,000 is an increase over um, what it would, what that maintenance is being done now. Okay, thank you. Um, and I guess also I can address this to you, uh, Darrell, we, we spoke uh, at budget standing committee about student hiring. Um, the students in the city that are normally working for the city, obviously unemployed, needing to go back to school next year without without funds. Um, you indicated that because of the union contract that we would have to hire back those who were laid off prior to hiring any students. Is that correct? Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, that is correct. And uh, the wording in the collective bargaining agreement uh, would require us to bring back our full-time staff prior to bringing back any casual seasonal employees or any student employees. So, and I'm, I'm speaking just of student employees in particular, has there been any discussion with the union to 
go outside the contract, so to speak, to allow some students to do jobs such as uh, trimming in at the cemetery, which needs it very bad, which is another phone call I made. I received this week, a couple indicating that the, the cemetery needs extra work and that for trimming gravestones uh, or trimming uh, boulevards, whatever. Uh, has there been any discussion with the union to allow that to happen? Through you, Mr. Mayor, no, we have not approached the union in that with that regard. Okay, thank you. Um, and just lastly, and uh, as far as our, our debt is concerned, um, we do have reserves, and I mentioned, as I mentioned before, we've always had reserves for our, for a rainy day. Well, we're not in a rainy day; we're in a thunderstorm. So I think we really have to look at our reserves. This is going to uh, uh, Director of Finance. We really have to look at our reserves to see if we can uh, take some money from from some reserves. I'd rather rather than take them from the Civic Project Fund. Um, and uh, I think that's that's something we've talked about putting a program for debt recovery in for a long time. And, and in my mind, there isn't a formalized debt recovery uh, program and here we are caught now. And I think that's something that uh, our finance department has to look at as, as a way to, uh, to monitor debt and, and reduce it uh, rather than just say, okay, we'll go from 10 to 15. Uh, so I think a, a defined program needs to uh, be put in place in order to control and perhaps reduce that in some way. Um, I'll make a, uh, an amendment at uh, the appropriate time if you want, Mr. Mayor. It basically is going to ask Director Smith to approach the union to consider allowing uh, some student hires uh, during the summer. Thank you. Okay, Evan, Evan, so I'll let you capture that. And then when you have an opportunity, you can put it up on the screen right away, but you know the intent of, and while we're, while Evan's capturing that, I will, I have on my list, Steve, Councillor Littleton, then Councillor Townsend, Councillor Kushner and Councillor Dodge. So Councillor Littleton, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to apologize if I'm asking a redundant question. I had a, a child uh, discussion in my office here and I might've missed it. Um, through you to the Director of Financial Service Management, um, if we go with the plan, do we have any reserves left? Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, there are some reserves that the, the city would uh, have remaining. Um, there are re city has um, a couple of different types of reserves. There's um, discretionary reserves as well as um, obligatory reserves, and those reserves we need to hang on to. Um, I would say that there um, would be um, the reserves, such as something like our winter control reserve. It is um, being held for um, uses um, such as you know uh, costs being incurred for winter control that are beyond. Um, the, the city's ability to cover them. There's a balance of 500,000 in that reserve. Um, there are a number of, of reserves that the city does have. Um, also the litigation insurance reserve. Um, it has a small um, available balance in, uh, in the reserve. Um, we did complete a, a report um, on the reserve balances where they stood at the end of 2019 as part of our um, report and I can recirculate um, that information um, to all of council. Um, there are just some restrictions with regards to how those re various reserve funds can be, um, be utilized. The reserve funds um, selected in this report are the reserves that um, in staff's opinion were the most appropriate um, reserves to use because of the general um, corporate nature of the um, forecasted year end deficit. Thank you. And so with the, um, the civic project fund, I just want to, I missed, I, I believe I missed it. And I, and I apologize to the rest of my colleagues for being happy to ask this again. Would this mean that it's depleted at this point? 
to you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, no councillor, the um, Civic Project Fund Reserve um, had a balance of approximately 4.3 million at the end of 2019 and using a little over a million dollars to mitigate, that would still leave approximately um, slightly over $3 million available to um, assist um, for future um, requirements. Okay, thank, thanks for that again and again, I apologize. Um, I do have another question about the revenues of, just following up on my colleagues' questions about the revenues from the cemetery. I don't mean any disrespect with this, but I'm having trouble understanding why we would be looking at reduced revenues for the cemetery. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, with regards to uh, the reduced revenues, we were looking at uh, the, the costs that we've incurred to date and looking at um, some of our um, trends with regards to the revenues. And we were looking to be somewhat consistent with regards to our revenue projections um, across um, you know, our various revenue sources. And um, that's the reason why we did uh, choose to reduce and think it was um, reasonable to reduce the cemetery revenues at this time. Are we experiencing an actual decrease in um, folks that need to have people, people have passed away? Is this an actual, like, I don't know how to ask this question. Um, well, I will, uh, I will start and um, Director uh, Smith is um, a little more familiar with the operations of the cemetery, but we are experiencing some um, decrease um, with regards to crypt uh, sales, um, and it, it does um, correspond to the um, available um, space that is there. Through you, Mr. Mayor. So nothing to do with COVID then? Sorry, Director Smith. Sorry, just to follow up to uh, what Director Douglas said, the it's the pre-planning sales and the crypt sales that are down right now. Um, okay. Whether it's related to COVID or not, I think there's probably uh, some relation to COVID as people, if it's not essential to go out and, and do it right now, they're not going to be going and doing it, but that's where we're experiencing a loss at this moment. Okay, that makes more sense to me. I can, I can understand that. Um, Another question about the uh, SMG uh, contract. Why would we not just give them two months at a time? Why would we approve six months? And then if they get this wage subsidy, say, okay, give it back to us. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, that's exactly what we're, we're proposing. So um, in, in the recommendation, we have um, basically a monthly um, discussion with, with ASM. And, what we're presenting is that worst case scenario. And if they get the wage subsidy, that will improve our cash position um, with, with ASM. So we would in fact um, be doing it on a monthly, month by month basis. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm thinking then that maybe we, we just approve uh, in our motion, just equal payments, like paying them out once a month, because I'm looking at this going, there's the golf course money. It's sitting right there, it, which may not be needed to be paid out. Um, that's my thinking with that. Is it possible that we could do that? Okay, so just if, um, Evan, if you can pull up the, the, the slide presentation on the costs, I'd like you to do that because a lot of the questions are focused around the costs that were shown in the slide deck. And then while Evan's getting that, <clears throat> I think so. I think it's this is the slide deck right here. It just, you know, it's about perspective for everybody. Um, so with that, uh, who wants to take a, who's going to answer Councillor Littleton? Well, Mr. Mayor, maybe I'll, I'll start. So I think where we're, um, where we're getting uh, some confusion is the way we've positioned the, the costs. And if you're looking at the slide, um, when we have put forward our mitigation strategy and when the 
um, the loss of revenue and the decision to close these, these facilities was made through the provincial order, we essentially restated our budget internally. And, and as we start to bring things back online, those costs come back, but we have to offset the loss in revenue and, and some of the other implications of, uh, of the pandemic. So in, in the case of the Meridian Center, essentially what we're saying is we, the, the worst case scenario would be the, the 600,000, give or take number. And as we go from month to month, if that improves, if in September, let's say they're able to put ice in the building and there's revenues that come back in, into that um, facility or other opportunities um, through wage subsidy, that number will reduce. And the management team at the Meridian Center is actively looking to do that. So by, by stating uh, the recommendation, we, we are effectively um, doing that. We're trying to state this to the end of year, not to the end of June, July, September. So the, and maybe I'll turn it over to our, our treasurer to, she might be able to explain it a bit better. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, with regards to um, how the Meridian Center is operated, because we have a management agreement with a, a separate company, um, they're responsible for managing the facility, um, but the city is responsible for providing all of the um, cash flow in order for them to um, maintain and manage the facility and its operations. So we've presented the recommendation in this way so that it's a worst case scenario until the end of the year. Um, however, we would be advancing one um, sixth of the amount on June the 25th to assist them with their cash flow. And then each month when we meet with the um, ASM global management with our uh, management team, we will review their, their cash position Position and we and how they've been doing with regards to um, their application for wage subsidy, their um, ways to further uh, potentially reduce their um, expenses, uh, looking for other revenue options that they may have, and then we can potentially reduce. Um, the amount that we are flowing to them, however, we need to be prepared as. Um, to be able to fund their 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 cash needs, and by delegating the authority to um, the deputy CAO um, and myself with regards to these conversations, then we are able to manage that through. Um, in order to ensure that they have the the cash to make their needs, just like the city is managing its cash and um, its needs to um, its um, liabilities. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my final questions, um, sorry everybody, we're going to go back to the golf course. I had asked for some detailed numbers about the golf course and one of the numbers that is in that, um, so the, the subtotal cost for the opening municipal golf course on July the 1st is 400, for my colleagues who don't have the, the benefit of looking at this chart, it's 456,000 less, which my, counsel, which my colleague, um, uh, Councillor Phillips asked about the revenues is less 75,000, which gives us this 381. In the 456, there's facility costs of 280. Is that, are those facility costs just facility costs regardless if we open or not? Like what is the cost of actually just having the facility itself if it stays closed or open? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, with regards to the to the facility, so included in the facility costs are things like the utilities of which um, watering um, the the watering of the um, the grounds is a significant portion of that. It's also the materials and the supplies needed to operate the um, the course, um, which includes uh, fuel. There's also insurance costs with that, and there's also um, some office related um, facilities. Um, as uh, Director Smith has has indicated, that the cost right now if we weren't to open the facility um, and we already have the staff and that has been factored into our number to maintain um, the course at a certain level um, if we're looking at any different operation we've made the assumptions with regards to operating the um, golf course that it would be open seven days um, uh, seven days a week and those are the factors that were 
um, used to make the determination of the cost to open the golf course at the cost of, at July 1st, of 381000 So I'm having, I'm really having a trouble with this. Lond the city of London has three um, municipal golf courses and they, they decided to open two of them. I'm concerned. I'm concerned of the dollar cost that we can't see. And what I'm talking about is the, the, the mental cost, the how does it feel to live in our community? What can we do in our community? And I feel like we can't quantify these. And I, I know I've had some offline discussions where I talk about it, when I'm working with my own clients in my own personal business, where we talk about, you gotta cut, you gotta cut, you gotta cut, you gotta save, you gotta save, you gotta save. But then there's this other column that I do talk about, and that is you need to live. And so that's where, we're, where I know um, the CAO, um, Shelly talked about this as well, where you know it, it just can't just be cut, cut, cut. And, and so this is the fine balance. And I'm really concerned shutting that we have so little open we you know when i'm hearing meridian center might have this wage subsidy where they may not have to give the money in september october but by september october it's already too late about the golf course it's done so i'm wondering if we can't maybe make a amendment there to open the golf course just july and august what would that look like those are the peak months that maybe that's all we get maybe we can look at it again in at the end of august and see what's going on but i'm just concerned that we have nothing open. I'm thinking of some seniors. They can't go to their senior centers. Their churches are closed. They're, where are their centers that they can actually get out? And I'm concerned that that soft cost, that, that dollar figure that we don't even know about yet, where Bob you know, doesn't need a hip replacement for 10 years if he can exercise by playing golf three times a week. Well, now he needs that hip replacement in four years. We can't quantify any of this. And I don't even know if any of this is true. I'm just... I'm just super concerned about this. And uh, can we look at that? Can we look at a July, August opening is what I'm asking. Thank you. Okay, so that was a question there. And <laughs> if someone wants to provide some kind of direction, maybe when we get to the amendment side, if, if let's, so let's, Evan, if you can capture that one, and if Councillor Littleton, you can you can hold that one. Uh, we could bring it to when we get to the voting of the amendments. Sure, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Should be working. Um, thank you. I just wanted to, uh, I guess, uh, uh, Councillor Littleton has uh, kind of a shared my my thought process with with the golf course i'm just i'm trying to get my head around obviously the numbers like other counselors have brought up the 382 would be the cost to run the golf course uh, i've had a lot of phone calls from residents in the community asking when it will be open you look at communities like london hamilton kitchener other municipalities have opened their golf courses uh, upon my research uh, i've looked you look at the city of hamilton for instance who has three golf courses that they run one being a 36 hole golf course, and they're operating to run the three golf courses at $550,000 a year. So I'm just, the number 381, I guess my question would go to Director Smith. Is there anything that the city can do to bring that number down? Uh, maybe it's looking at running a skeleton crew like they're doing right now in the city of Hamilton, where they have five or six individuals running one of the, uh, the Shadok golf course, for instance, is that any, is that something we can do? Or uh, because the union, for instance, do, would we have to call back all of those staff that work um, at the golf course? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So I want just to take a step back to try to put this in a little bit of perspective. Most of our operations, in fact, um, not just myself, but uh, Director Christie and, and Director Martuccio, our operations that we run in the summer rely on casual senior seasonal employees and students to run them. Um, so we have a pool of full-time staff right now of which we have some that are off. So of that pool, we have to bring those back first uh, with all due respect to Councillor Phillips, 
uh, motion at, at this point without uh, the union agreeing to it, we would have to bring the full-time union staff back first. We allow in our normal costs of running these facilities, student wages and casual seasonal wages, which help alleviate some of the cost. The cost that you see here in front of you and uh, Director uh, Douglas can correct me if I'm wrong, are using our full-time employees because we have an obligation to bring them back first, which right off the bat makes it more expensive. Um, with respect to operating the golf course more efficiently, um, it's along with any other operation we do, we regularly review it and try to find a way, efficient ways to review that, to do it. I don't see sitting here off the top of my head, and I have to admit that this conversation for the most part is a way to cut the staff in half. Could we possibly find a way to cut one or two staff people out if if we modify the hours or modify the days or modify the number of holes? That is a possibility. And if council will wishes to direct me to do that through their motion, then then I will work very hard to accomplish that. Um, the the overall operation with respect to the city facilities and, and where we sit. Um, I guess the part of the conversation is uh, around um, where are the priorities to use that pool of staff that we have. And, and that's uh, probably a discussion that needs to be had at some point. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Smith. I guess just, I guess just my frustration with this is as, as Councillor Littleton said, people are looking for for things to, to do and for places to go. A lot of the city's, uh, city facilities obviously are closed. I would really like to see the golf course open for July, August, September, October. Uh, just reaching out and talking with, with folks who are working in the, the city ones in Hamilton. Uh, they have four to five staff right now working a 36 hole golf course. So I'm just, I, I guess, is that something maybe we can reach out and, and ask like how are other municipalities doing this uh, in or, and also finding ways to kind of cut down on those costs. Is that something that maybe we can include in this amendment that uh, maybe city staff can reach out to these other municipalities to see how they're doing and running these their own golf courses? Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I'll, I'll jump in here. Certainly uh, we can and we'll do that. I think um, with all the numbers and all the decisions, this feels a little bit like an annual budget exercise and really what it's been um, from the staff perspective is that we're currently running with a certain complement of staff and expenses that we're having. And so knowing that we were going to run into a deficit, we looked at it and made some decisions based on priorities. And certainly if council wishes to change those and indicate to us, this is something council wishes to place a higher priority on than staff did, that's fine. It really was, we knew we had to make some hard decisions we looked at the various criteria, you know, that director or deputy CEO Oaks and I spoke about to make those decisions. And this is really the chance for council to say, you know, staff, we recognize you've made those decisions. We assign a higher priority to, let's say the golf course than you did. And we wish you to proceed on this basis. So um, it's the whole thing is something that we can't afford. So, you know, our decisions on what the priority is for the community, we've tried to look at that through the lenses that we told you about. If you're hearing from constituents and council wishes to place those priorities on those items, then, then you know, today's the day to tell us that so that we can plan for that. And we'll plan, we'll plan to do that in the most efficient, effective way possible. Because as ourselves, we don't want to be in that deficit at the end of the year. And, and perhaps that's the other comment that I would make at this time is that, you know, the opening dates can move or slide depending on the, what the province says and depending on lots of factors in the community. So today, are we deciding, yes, we're going to use these reserves or we're gonna issue this debt? We aren't, we're saying to council, these are the mechanisms. If we don't get any additional funding from the feds and province, we have to use these things. We don't want to, so we're trying to minimize. So if, if that helps, um, you know, and when we look at what does the golf course cost to run it isn't like our regular budget exercise it's that we currently have this many people we have this you know we're expending this much in utilities and whatever 
if we now bring, as we bring on different amenities, we'll now get a few of our staff back, we'll now expend more on utilities. And that's, I, I think that's why there's a little bit of confusion. Believe me, staff working through these numbers also um, took a number of turns as to, as to how do we actually calculate this. It's a little bit different than the normal bu budget exercise, but we've presented what we feel priorities would be. And certainly council is the ultimate decider of what those priorities are. And whatever is decided, we'll work to do that the most efficient, effectively possible. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, CAO Chemnitz. I um, I would be in support uh, of any uh, amendment being made, uh, put forth by Councillor Littleton or uh, Councillor Phillips, to see uh, some type of uh, way in which we can get that the, the course open. I also I wanted to, if we can, if it's possible, can um, just put up number. I believe it was number two on the recommendations of, I think it was Councillor Cisco also added to it. I, it was the closure, the street closures. Yeah, there is there, thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, I, was, I was going to be bringing in um, a, a notice of motion to look at the feasibility of having part of the Welling Kennel Parkway closed down. I know Councillor Williamson had already mentioned it. Um, I, I would be curious to see if that's something that we could also look at doing. If you look at the city of Toronto, Lakeshore, they do it on weekends uh, to allow for more social distancing. Uh, the park, or the Welling Canal Parkway now, you may see a lot of cyclists and uh, runners and walkers out. It might be beneficial to have a part of the parkway uh, closed and uh, preferably an area where there is not necessarily a need for um, accessible to um, to get into subdivisions or whatnot. I'm wondering if that's something that we could include and if that would be a friendly amendment uh, to, with uh, Councillor Cisco. Okay. Councillor Cisco. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, if, if um, it, it's friendly and we could add it uh, after St. Paul Street, uh, including but not limited to St. Paul Street and the Welling Canal Parkway. Uh, does that work for Councillor uh, Councillor Townsend? Yeah, that would be uh, that's perfect. And I, I think maybe um, it, it. I'm not saying like the whole um, Welling Canal Parkway, but just like um, a portion of it that would be that would not be, I guess, uh, limiting people's access to their their homes. Yep. Yep. I'm happy to make that friendly, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Townsend. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, uh, the skip, I'm hoping that council, I, I do support and um, I hope that other councillors will support the uh, reinstate, uh, reinstation of the skip funding uh, as a PAC board member. It's, this is a, a really important uh, thing for us to continue to do and include. And as we know, the arts community is one of the vulnerable ones that are um, gonna be most impacted by uh, this. So I'm asking that uh, other councillors would be supportive of that. So and thank you to Councillor Porter for making that amendment. And that's all, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Townsend. Uh, I got Councillor Kushner. You're up next. There. Can there you, you hear me? Yep, there you are. Yeah, the question I have is with respect to the golf course um, also, and uh, I look at the private sector and they're opening their golf courses. So that means it's profitable for them to do it. If it wasn't profitable, they would not open them. So why the discrepancy between what we appear to be doing and what they're doing? Um, perhaps, sorry, Mr. Mayor, perhaps I can, uh, at the city, we do not run a profitable golf course. Okay, that, uh, if that's the case, uh, could we not consider some type of uh, COVID uh, premium and add on? Many businesses are doing that uh, when they expect to reopen. Mr. Mayor, that, that is um, something that we have seen out in the marketplace. We, um, the city's rates and fees are approved um, 
annually or more than that if needed by um, council specifically and uh, have there's legislative requirements to have a public meeting. There is some flexibility we do have in the golf course fees uh, to respond to industry pressures. Um, I, I would have to um, look back to see what that specifically was. I recall it was rather to for us to bring the fees down when the industry was suffering um, difficulties in, in um, I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure that it would give too much uh, relief for us to make additional revenue. And in fact, I think some of the concerns that we've had expressed from citizens is that our golf course is more affordable than others. Thank you. The, the next question I have with the deficit reduction, does that have any impact on us obtaining federal and provincial monies? How are they going to be allocating that money the mayor uh, this afternoon indicated that uh, the money we're getting so far is the gas money and there's nothing uh, additional to that. So my question is, if we reduce our deficit, does that uh, reduce our ability to obtain federal and provincial monies? Uh, through Mr. Mr. Mayor, at this point, as, as, there, has, as there has been no announced program, it's, um, unclear as to what will uh, make municipalities either eligible or not eligible for funding. Um, I would say that, and I don't know, this is pure conjecture here, I would say that municipalities who perhaps are not very responsible in, in how they're conducting their business, that um, there may be some hesitancy to provide funding if if um, municipalities have not made any sort of mitigative efforts. And we've done that. So I would be comfortable that we wouldn't have that. There, there is also a, um, a feeling that if a, a municipality could afford to move along and not, ha not need federal and provincial, then with, a, with the very strong revenue challenges that they have, that they may um, not seek to give funding to municipalities who say perhaps that their impact isn't strong. So there has been some concern that um, you know, why use up our reserves if money is coming? So I would say that in this report, we've presented these as options that uh, certainly have a very strong negative financial sustainability and resiliency impact to our community and to our city. So it is, while there is money that um, we could allocate towards a projected deficit, we in no way feel that is the right answer for this community as it will future hamper us for future financial sustainability um, and make certainly our community far less in the, in the future. And what are other municipalities doing? Are they doing something similar or what? Uh, other municipalities have taken uh, similar stances in being very uh, forthright with the amount of, of the revenue strains and the expenditure strains that they are having. Um, some municipalities have indicated various reserves that ha they have available to mitigate I would say none of us are suggesting that we make any of those firm decisions today other than say this is a path we could use. We're responsibly, you know, staff are in the, in the position of when we say, when we come to council and say we are choosing to open these certain facilities knowing very well that we can't afford them, we feel obligated to say to council, there are ways that we will not, um, that we have to mitigate this and, and ensure that we have appropriate cash flow, ensure that we are able to fund that deficit. However, in no way do we want that's want to do these things. That's why I said at the beginning, as a treasurer, you'd say, well, we, we can't afford any of this, but our community needs us to. So um, we present those here, certainly not anticipating that um, tomorrow we would start taking money out of reserves and, and say, okay, we're fine, ready to go. This is a decision that we would be making later in the year um, as we approach year end and as we have further clarity on um, what our actual results are. This has been um, for the finance staff, a large exercise in continuously redoing and redoing and redoing the budget as far as, not really the budget, I guess I'm giving the wrong implication there, our forecast what was at the end of the year. So they've worked uh, very hard at what is still an estimate because there are very large assumptions we're making that could change. Dates of opening, abilities to open, um, when things are open, who will feel comfortable using them, et cetera. So um, 
it's difficult. We don't have a program to say what, how we would. So we're trying to be very responsible. We're trying to say to the community, look, we know this is $10.5 million this is a huge impact. You know, we're not going to, we have ways to mitigate it. None of which are good for our future and none of which we want to do, but we can't maintain a deficit. So we have to provide something responsibly to council to say, when we suggest you, we incur this investment of $10.5 million, here is if nothing else comes forward, this is how we would uh, make that up. And then we would seek to make it up if over many years to come. We would lose a lot of ground in, our, in the planning that we've been very good in the last budget committee and council has been very strong in supporting reserves and supporting uh, debt management, et cetera. As I recall, in one of your previous reports, you talked about the deficit being approximately two and a half million. And then today you're referring to 10 million. Correct. So that earlier number was to the earlier date of, I believe, uh, May and June. We were looking at a shorter time horizon. And so what's happened since that estimate and now is that we have the province's uh, recovery plan. You know, we, we look around the country and there have been some positive results in, in um, reducing that curve that we talked about a number of weeks ago. So now we say, okay, there is a very real possibility of us being able to open things up. What does that look like? When we talked about the $2.9 million, the, the future of what the summer and fall would look like was very cloudy. We're starting to get a little more idea of what it will be. So now it's now we feel comfortable saying, okay, to the end of the year, this is our best guess as to how things will probably roll out. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Kushner, and I have Councillor Dodge, and then Councillor Miller, and then Councillor Williamson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have a couple of, of follow-up questions. I don't know whether, are we waiting to talk to the um, uh, the amendments that have been made at the end? Yeah, once we get okay. to all the amendments on the screen, um, if you wanna make an amendment to a section of it, you could do it now, but then okay. once we get to the motion, we'll do each amendment. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Mayor, at this time then, I think that I would like to uh, make a referral motion if I may. And um, it's to move items seven through 14. And um, speaking quickly to that, my reasons for that is, um, you know, due to the hardships that this pandemic has attacked our financial resiliency and our sustainability, and has created a significant deficit for our city, and it's putting huge pressures on how we are able to deliver our services moving forward from this. And um, I'm asking that it get referred back to the budget in September so that we can, uh, this can be considered as part of a comprehensive review moving forward with the 2020 and 2020. I know that we already approved 2020, but 2021 budget and how we're gonna roll this out. And this gives us an opportunity to pursue other um, emergency fundings from other levels of government and to work with other people, AMO, LUMCO and, and so on to maybe um, perhaps make this a little easier on our, uh, on our, you know, situation in the end. So I don't know if we vote on that or whatever, but that would be my request. No, I can't hear you, Mr. Mayor. That'll be a, thank you, Councilor Dodge. That'll be a referral when we get to that point. Evan, if you could just highlight that area. And then when we get there, I explained it. We'll have a vote when we get there. Okay. Oh, from I wasn't calling anybody. <laughs> it wasn't me. Okay. Sorry. Um, Councillor Dodge. You got okay. Some. Sorry about that. So then uh, um, I just have a couple of questions when it comes in regards to um, the extra, you know, um, monies that we having to spend because of COVID measures to, you know, the extra cleaning and on all that stuff. Um, my understanding is that we're keeping track of that. Are, are we going to be trying to recover some of those costs over and above anything else that we might be entitled to? 
Thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you to you, Mr. Mayor. With regard to the COVID um, costs that we are incurring, like the additional costs and uh, if there's any additional PP&E that's being required, we are tracking that separately. And part of the reason that we chose to do that is if there are um, funding opportunities available, we want to have those costs available. So um, yes, we will if there's any opportunity um, and we do have that information should it be needed. Thank you. And then um, one final question, I guess. Um, I'm not sure, but I've, I've, um, I've, you know, what they would be called or whatever, but my understanding is there are, um, um, grants and, and different ways of, uh, getting monies now for, um, like student employees, if we have, if we bring those back and whatnot, are we able to do that? Like to help with offset some of the costs if we were to say to bring them back just to do, um, the golf course or grass cutting or whatever, are we entitled or have we gone through any of those venues to get any of those monies that possibly could be available? Um, thank you. Through, you. through you, Mr. Mayor, with regards to the student grant program, the, it is an application-based program, and those applications were due back um, in the first quarter of the year, and the city does regularly apply for certain uh, areas for those grants. Um, and I, it's unfortunate, but I don't believe that those grants we would be able to apply now. Um, we did apply for the grants that we typically would for for, stu for summer student programs. We did already apply because I, 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 my understanding was that they were going to extend that or they were opening something up because of the situation now. So if we could maybe look into that, I'd appreciate that. Through Mr. Mayor, yes, we can do that. Thank you. And that's all I have right now, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dodge, Councillor Miller, and then Councillor Williamson. Uh, thank you. Certainly, um, you know, thanks staff for all the hard work. Uh, just and I, I definitely get to support uh, my colleague, Councillor Littleton's amendment. I think it's a good uh, sort of compromise on something like the golf course. Just sticking with the golf course, I guess I, guess I have two questions. One sort of technical, clerical, and I'm sorry if I, you know, should already understand this, but in terms of something like the golf course where we budgeted the money, um for for the 2020 season obviously haven't opened you know how how does where's that money you know did budget committee decide does council decide is that something we delegated to staff in terms of where the money we put in the budget for uh for something like the golf course i know there's there's probably a hundred other examples uh where does it get moved to and and, and how is that decision made uh through mr mayor okay i'll start because this is a I think this is a point of confusion, understandably, um, again, because what we're doing looks very much like a budget and, and exercise today. Um, the budget that was approved for 2020 stays the same. So we haven't made any changes. We haven't opened up the budget. We haven't looked at any of that. What we have done is said, okay, from what we're operating today, if we want to start to open up facilities, what will be the investment in resources that we need to make and how will that either positively or negatively affect our year end results? So this is really not choosing what budgets to change, but just saying, okay, if we start to do these various activities, how will our year end result, will it be a surplus, will it be a deficit? Right? So council and staff, staff are not recommending any changes to the budget merely saying we now need to work with the money that we have and how will we end up either positive or negative at the end of the year and what decision it's a big variance exercise really and what are our priorities at that right now if that that makes it clear that's why sometimes how much will the golf course cost is a confusing thing it's not really how much it costs and entirely it's how much more will we need to put in it to open it okay, okay fair enough i i think um, one of the issues we've had with the golf course, I think everyone knows this by now, is there was some confusion in the community going back to last year about whether it was going to be open or not. We had, we had a, a number of delegations come in uh, and speak to it. And then there was the RFP this, this uh, spring that I think added a little bit to the confusion about, you know, what's really going on, what's the long-term plan. Have we had an opportunity, I know staff are incredibly busy and this would, would possibly be a low priority. Have we had an opportunity to engage with some of the stakeholders? You know, I'm thinking specifically the union leagues, the teachers leagues, things like this that regularly use that course. Uh, because I think once again, there's a lot of worry in the community because of our, our budget 
discussions last time and because the RFP and now because, you know, maybe we're recommending not to reopen the course that, that this might mean the course is, is, is done for good. And I think some reassurance of those key stakeholders would, would be a pretty useful exercise. Is that, have we, I, again, I know everyone's, everyone's really pressed for time, but have we had that opportunity yet? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll start and, and maybe Director Christie may want to, to jump in there. So to reassure the, the public out there with respect to the long-term aspects of the golf course, one of the reasons why we have staff there doing maintenance on the golf course is to ensure that whatever decision this council makes on the future of the golf course, that it will still be viable as a golf course if council so decides to do that. If we did not do that maintenance, we would lose the golf course in one year and, and there would be a substantial investment required to bring it back. With respect to engagement, we have uh, put some engagement um, on through our website to garner some input from the public and from staff members, but or from uh, the public and from stakeholders, but we have not, as of this, other than that, initiated any other formal engagement um, for it, it was on the work plan to do this year unfortunately with the COVID it was one of the things that had to be put on the back burner okay um, well like I said uh, I think I think Councillor Littleton's hit on a pretty good compromise and I think that will probably go towards uh, reassuring uh, those regular users because you know I, I as we've talked about this ad nauseum, but it is important uh, as an accessible, both physically and monetarily uh, accessible form of recreation in the community. So certainly hope we can uh, see fit to support that. And that's all for me. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first question, in terms of, uh, we've opened tennis courts, we've kept passive use of parks and trails. Um, has there any, and we've heard about uh, golf courses and other locations from various councillors. Uh, have any other municipalities talked about opening pools or any other recreational facilities that we knew about through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Mr. Christie or Mr. Smith? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, city, the city of Niagara Falls, uh, uh, just reading the, uh, the, the latest media update from their uh, latest council meeting, uh, just approved the opening of their outdoor pools uh, for July 1, uh, pending, of course, approvals from the province and public health. Uh, I, we, we are in contact with the other municipalities from uh, our neighboring municipalities, and um, we're in similar positions in, the, in that we are considering them and uh, obviously waiting for appropriate, appropriate approvals. Um, we know that uh, in speaking with other folks from across the province, for example, the city of Toronto has decided that they will not be opening outdoor pools, uh, but that splash pads are similar to us uh, or will be part of their uh, cooling center uh, strategies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have a, a bit of a, a mixed bag of uh, different approaches, if you will, from across uh, across the uh, sort of the greater horseshoe area anyway. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up, I take it it would be quite challenging to get any kind of social distancing if we had uh, pools open with numbers of people attending if we have a hot spell. Uh, yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so this is uh, obviously we're taking best guesses here because we've never done this before, but um, we think that we can, um, you know, for, for any of our programs and any of our assets um, and locations, we can certainly help to um, control access and numbers into the specific, you know, into the areas. But once they're in the water, it's really difficult to, uh, you know, to be able to enforce any, any sort of distancing, right? Uh, kids will want to have fun and, and be close to each other and splash each other and all those kinds of things. So it will be much, much more difficult in that setting compared to a, uh, uh, an area like a splash pad, for example, where you can see everybody uh, on the surface and you can designate areas uh, physically and, and all those kinds of things, right? So 
it would be much difficult, but again, that's a best guess for us because we've never had to do it. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for the uh, Director of Financial Management Services. And uh, this, the, the cost of equipping people with technology, um, internet, laptops, et cetera, who are working remotely, um, do we have a, a line item for that? Have I missed it? Or what, what kind of costs are we talking about in that regard? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll begin and perhaps the dire Director of Corporate Support Services um, may assist. Um, with regards to um, use of um, laptops and city computers, um, all of the staff um, are using their um, existing equipment. Um, the early on uh, in the year when uh, we saw the pandemic, um, our IT um, area had a number of pieces of equipment that were supposed to be going um, for, um, for auction and they were held back so that we would be able to, to reserve these um, for just for the exact use that we have been able to repurpose them. Um, as far as additional costs with um, for internet services and those types of things, um, that is handled on a, uh, you know, a, 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 a staff by um, staff position. And um, I don't have um, exact uh, figures with regards to that, but if that is something that um, we would be looking for, we could uh, gather that for you. Well, I guess I just looking at, is it going to be a significant cost do you figure or is it uh, not going to be that much? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I don't anticipate it being a significant uh, cost at this point. Thank you. And just a, a general comment in terms of summing up what some other people I think have articulated and that is just general quality of life and condition of parks and the yeah, appearance of the city. And there's so many people that are off work and a lot of after a crummy COVID spring, both weather-wise and being cooped up, people people are out and about, and I think maybe are noticing um, things more so than in the past. Um, so I get that we're we're reducing uh, the number of employees, but I, I, I'm wondering if maybe we've gone down to too skeletal uh, a situation and hiring back some people. I, I don't know the ins and outs and. Uh, it would be nice to have some students in as well. So in terms of just general philosophy, I would like to see some people returning to the front lines to do some of that kind of work, just to improve the aesthetics appearance and, and uh, boost people's morale more uh, than anything else. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Williamson. And um, so we've gone through the council list for what would be more questions. Uh, now we can head into what it should be around the discussion of the motion in front of us. And I know, Councillor Porter, you have your hand up, but we're, we're moving into trying to get through the approvals on, <clears throat> um, on the amendments and everything. Are you okay if we, I, I don't wanna go back through, um, um, I don't, if we go back through the circle again, we're just we're gonna be here for another hour and a half. I agree, I'm fine. I can wait. Okay, so what we have here, is, no, I'm, I'm gonna explain this first. Um, so what we have here is we have the motion uh, that was brought forward and there's been a couple of, of amendments. So we'll, we will deal with the amendments first. Uh, we can have discussion on each amendment. I'm asking council to, uh, instead of maybe providing, if you have some clarification, uh, but if you're gonna provide an opinion, please keep it as briefly as possible. Because uh, we do have, we got a lot more in this agenda to get through. Um, so it's on the floor, uh, seconded by, who seconded this? Councillor Cisco, you moved it. Uh, seconded by Councillor Phillips. Okay. Councillor Garcia, what do you have? Mr. Mayor, I just have an amendment. I didn't realize I was the first one to speak that I could add amendments in. So I submitted that to the, uh, the clerk's office. But essentially, my amendment is regarding the uh, Five percent or the ten percent debt debt limit, and I'm saying that if debt exceeding the current ten percent of total expenses is deemed to be required, that this decision come to council for approval. Okay, so that that already will take place. So we don't need to have that in there, councillor. They can't go above ten without coming to a 
So that that's not a required uh, motion at this time. So if I okay, can, thank you. I can ask the clerk to strike that. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask the clerk to take us through this. We've got the way we'll do this is go with the amendments first, and then we'll go back to the main motion. So the one in red, that was a friendly amendment. So we can leave that as part of the original motion. Evan? Point of order, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Okay, so I submitted an amendment for that one. And uh, I'm sorry I didn't put it on the floor because when I first spoke, the, uh, the report hadn't been put on the floor, it hadn't been moved. So I, I do have an amendment that's already in with the clerks and I put it on and it's to uh, uh, number two, recommendation number two. Evan, can you pull it up, please? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'll have to ask Mr. Mayor, I'll have to ask Councillor Cisco if he, he uh, deems this to be a friendly amendment. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I'm just reading it here. Um, I, I would prefer, it would be friendly if we could take out um, the words at the direction of, um, in partnership with, I, 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 I would always hesitate to take the power away from our staff to make the final decision. That's as part of the delegation. Uh, if the council is willing to take out at the direction of uh, and leave it as in partnership with the St. Catharines Downtown BIA and other business associations like the Facer District Merchants and Residents Association. Uh, and I don't have a problem with the associations taking the lead role, but I, I don't feel comfortable taking the final authority away from our staff. So if the council, if Councilor Sorrento is willing to, uh, to allow that, I would be friendly. Mr. Mayor? Can you hear? Mr. Mayor? Councilor Sorrento, I, just, I was just saying it sounded like Anonymous has taken over Councilor Cisco's voice. Yes, that, that was, that was. Something's wrong with your mic, Councilor Cisco. Either that uh, or you've been hacked. Okay, and I haven't managed to take out the portion that I was concerned about. I'm just hoping that Councilor Sorrento will consider that to be fair. Councilor Sorrento. Can we, can we put, Mr. Mayor, there's a reason I'm going with this. Can we put it at, then remove that and say at the request of in partnership. So it's kind of two in one. Because this is coming from staff and, and something that I believe in. So this is very important. So will you accept at the request? Well, and, I guess the only, I'm gonna jump in here. When you say at the request, if, if there's a number of businesses in a certain area that want to do this, but the BIA doesn't, I think we still have to listen to the businesses as well. So okay. it, should be at the, it should be in partnership with. Okay, that's fine. And I'm, I'm content. Um, and, and here's my only concern is that, you know, I don't want staff to make the ultimate decision because if they make the decision, Mr. Mayor, of closing down some of the streets and some of the businesses down there and some of the members are going to be very upset. So I don't want to put our staff in that in that situation. So hence the amendment. Uh, so if if everybody is good with that and perhaps I'll get Director York to speak to that amendment, Mr. Mayor, and then I'll be content to go with it. Is that OK? So, um, the amendment has been deemed friendly, so we don't need to talk about it right now. Fair enough. Okay, then we'll go ahead with it. Great. Thank you. And uh, for Evan, it's not amendment number one because it's a friendly amendment. Thank you. Okay, moving down. So I just want to get to the amendments and if there's any other amendments, moving down. Um, so this is the first one we'll vote on. This is the SKIP program because this is, now this was made friendly at two. I'm looking at Councillor Cisco. Is this a friendly amendment? Yeah, okay. Yes, that's right. All right, yeah, you're going to have to fix your mic. I think they're, you you do have some kind of robotic thing that's happened. I don't know what it is. Um, and then we go to Councillor Dodge. Uh, Councillor Dodge, the referral to the Budget Standing Committee. And this is a referral to the Budget Standing Committee for their, I believe, a September meeting. And looking to the CAO. In terms of the CAO, just for information, uh, from a cash position in the city, does any of this decision around the um, reserves have an impact immediately, or is this something that's at the end of the year? Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's, it's appropriate for budget committee 
it won't cause us an issue to take it to budget committee in September. As I had indicated, we would, won't be making final decisions on these right now. So we're, uh, staff are comfortable with that referral. Okay, so it's a referral. Just a show of hands for the referral on this one, unless there's a recorded vote, but I think it's a referral. All in favor of the referral? Okay, that's carried. Thank you for that, Councillor Dodge. Are there any other amendments before we get to the main motion? Um, amendment, so staff request to be, um, okay, so I wanna, I'm trying to figure out how to treat this one as, is this a, this is a direction to staff. Um, you wanna do a show of hands. Here's what I would like from this though. If this, whatever the answer is, can, can it be sent in a memo or would we have to go or could, does we have to wait for the next term of council, like next meeting of council? Can if we get the answer back, can it be shared in a memo? I'll look to either Director Pilateri or Director to the CAO. If Director Pilateri can start, that would be the best. Sure, three, Mr. Mayor. Um, we can have those discussions and uh, a memo I think is appropriate to, uh, to share with council, not a problem. So staff direct, oh, Councillor Townsend. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to have maybe included in the, the bottom part with Councillor Littleton. We're not, uh, not on that one yet. We're just on, okay. the, on the first one, Councillor. Okay. Okay, so just all in favor, show of hands for the direction to staff to work with the unions. Okay, so that's a direction to staff. Now we'll go to what will be the golf course. Okay, so this is one where we'll open it again for, we've had some good discussion on it, but we wanna, we wanna make sure we have further discussion. Councillor Littleton, this is your motion. Thank you. I just also wanted to mention that the, the point here is I, I really appreciate the director um, discussing this and the, 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 uh, the, sorry, the sentiment of this is really just to get it open for a little bit of time, get some people to go. If it also helps, if we look at, at data and it looks like we have very few people golfing on a Monday or a Tuesday, you can put in there too that we open from Wednesday to Sunday. Like whatever we got to do here to try and get it open, to get people to use it, maximize our abilities, maximize our staff, maximize our resources. So I'm, I'm amendable to that as well, if that's gonna help. I don't know if that's your numbers or not. Whatever whatever it is, is what it is. So if, but it just, does that make any sense at all to anybody? <laughs> okay, thank you, Councillor Littleton. Um, so I got Councillor Townsend. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. One thing that I, I would like to see added to this, and I'm hoping that Councillor Littleton would see it friendly, is that um, to reevaluate following the July and August opening to see if September, October would be uh, something that would be feasible. Uh, so I'm hoping that would be something we could add in. That's friendly for sure. Okay, can we get the, uh, can we get the wording for that, Evan? Um, Councillor Kushner, you're up next, then Councillor Porter and Councillor Sorrento. I'll pass, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kushner. Uh, Councillor Porter, then Councillor Sorrento. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I did hear from some members of the community, um, but as I'm looking at a $10 million deficit um, and staff have worked really hard to save us $3 million and have had to lay off staff. Um, I can't support spending several hundred thousand dollars to open a golf course for two months when there are private sector facilities that I believe can accommodate uh, some of the golfers. So this isn't about the long term of the golf course. I just think for this season, um, given everything we're facing in terms of our budget, um, this is not a wise spend of money um, and we need to be focusing on um, really essential services right now that I think are um, also at risk and especially when I think about um, staff coming back to work uh, we have to put it additional staff in place in places like the market we might have to put additional staff in place um, when we open up beaches to make sure that there's safe social distancing um, this is a uh, it's not something I can support right now because I do believe um, people who golf can be accommodated by the private sector. 
Um, and we've spent a long time talking about this. Um, and I guess uh, that's my point. So I, I won't be supporting this. Um, it doesn't mean I wouldn't support keeping the golf course maintained so that we can open it um, and have a good plan for it in the long term. But right now, not during COVID. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Porter. And we got Councillor Sorrento. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My comments are similar to Councillor Porter's. And, and I know that there were references to other communities. So London and Hamilton and a quick Google search shows that their budget and uh, any one of my colleagues can double check this. I think London, Ontario, I think I saw 2.6 billion. I'm, I'm hoping that's not a, a typo. And Hamilton has, I believe, a 244 million. Maybe they bumped it up to 365 million with, with, their, with their capital budget. Mr. Mayor, staff have worked very, very hard. If we put money into the golf course, that means something else is gonna suffer. We got a $3 million loss with transit, Mr. Mayor. And so I basically concur with Councillor uh, Councilor, uh, Porter and I can't support it, but this council did vote to keep it open. Everybody gets a, a get out of jail card this year for COVID. We try again next year and, and I, I can't support it. There's too many people suffering and we cannot be all things to all people. So there are people that use buses and, and a lot of people who don't use them. There are people that use the library and a lot of people that don't, and there are people that golf and there are probably more people that don't than do. So we can't be all things to all people. So I, I can't support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Councilor Sorrento. Uh, Councillor Kushner, your hand's still up. Can I lower your hand? Uh, Councillor Miller, you're up. Thank you. Yeah, as I said earlier, I'll be supporting. And I, I think one thing that we shouldn't forget about here is that, that the city, speaking of people suffering, the city has laid off permanent workers for the first time in, in a long time. And morale among staff is, is, you know, among everyone going through this emergency, but certainly the opportunity to bring some staff back uh, would be a benefit to them. And, and I think a benefit to the city as well. You know, I, I, as wonderful, I think, as the private sector is, uh, we should be very proud of our record as an employer. So I think this is a good opportunity to say to, to our employees, hey, we're looking at, at ways that we, that we can bring you back. And so it's not just that it's a benefit to the golfers, which I think it is a huge benefit. I think this is something we can say to, to some of the employees we've unfortunately had to lay off that, you know, we are looking for ways uh, to bring you back and, and to get you working again. I think that as we reopen this whole thing's about reopening it's important for us to do our part as an employer as we expect um the private sector to do as well so uh certainly in, in support of this and and looking at what the results are for september and october as well okay thank you councillor miller and councillor kushner you had your hand up again now you got on you got on mute though hit your unmute looks like you're yelling at me in ukraine <laughs> you gotta hit on mute don't turn the camera off. <laughs> he turns the camera. There you go. There's guy, Evan. You got to help him. Come on. Yeah, he's he is yelling at me in Ukrainian. There. There you go. There you go. Yeah. The question I have, uh, Mr. Mayor, I did uh, bring up the possibility of putting a temporary add-on uh, onto the fees, and I understood that staff would be considering that. Yeah, and I think if I can go to the CAO. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, we will look at that and we'll uh, memo council as to uh, what would be required or if we already have sufficient um, ability to do that. I know that there was in previous years some flexibility to that those particular rates and fees. I'm just, my apologies, I can't recollect right now what they specifically were. So we'll get back to council with that. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, Evan, if you can just go back to the, the slide with the, the sort of the facilities, and it, it, it's just to highlight, a, highlight sort of the staff work here. So again, it's more for the public. So again, and, and I, I, I don't disagree with Councillor Miller. I, I think, you know, we do have an obligation that when we're able to, to bring things back into service, first and foremost, it's to the union. Like we, and I'll be honest, we shouldn't be bringing students back until we have a full complement of our our union, because they're the ones who are paying mortgages right now. And I, I understand the cost of schooling, but the most important thing is these, these folks have mortgages, they got bills to pay and they're laid off right now. And so, but when you look at a, 
a, a number like this, um, we have to ask ourselves as councils as well, is there anything in this list um, that we can defer opening today to be able to accommodate some of the some of the costs incurred from the golf course? And so I'm not asking for council to make any decisions, but be mindful of of this page. I think it's an, an important page for a council to pay attention to because we don't know when the older adult centers are going to be able to open. We don't know if that's September. Uh, we don't know if the arenas will be able to open up until September, October. So the losses that were being projected, there still can be significant impacts on the budget moving into the fall. And we got to be mindful of this list. And that's that's the last thing. Do we need to open up the Kiwanis field at all for, for this season? And if not, why not? And, you know, continue to ask staff about this list because we've got to be very cognizant as we bring employees back. Cause I believe beaches and splash pads in the summertime are going to be the most important amenity that we actually contribute to community. Because if we hit 32, 35 degrees, that's where they're going to go. They're going to go to the splash pads and they're going to go to the beaches. The difference between us and Niagara Falls is Niagara Falls doesn't have any beaches and they have very few splash pads. So that's why they have to open up the pools because they recognize when it gets to a certain temperature, people are going to need a place to go, especially those who don't have central air or any other water amenity on their own property. They're heading there. So staff have been very aware of what's the human impact of what we're doing. And so I, I, I do agree with Councillor Councillor. Uh, Littleton about the mental health side of it, but in this entire list, can I just ask council that we be mindful sort of every meeting as the economy opens or retracts based on COVID-19, where are these costs going to have an impact on the bottom line? So um, be mindful of that is all I can say, because it is, there's jobs in all of these numbers and uh, we got to figure out in terms of the jobs, there's also implications on the bottom line for our taxes. And one of the things I got to flag is that I'm, I'm not hearing anything from the province that they're going to step up and cover significant losses. I'm not hearing it yet. I know, I know our MPP Birch has uh, made a motion at Queens Park to provide an emergency fund. We haven't seen anything yet, though. So every decision that we make that goes to this 8.25 million, that might be a real number at the end of the year. So I can't say definitively that, the, that the, we'll get bailed out. So that might be a real number. So when we're making the decisions, um, we got to make sure that we're making them with both the fiscal reality, but also what's the human, what's the human issue through all of these. And um, there's an impact in all of them. So I, you know, I, these are the tough decisions we have to make. That's, that's all I'd, I'd say. So if we can go back to the motion on the floor, um, I'll call a question on the golf course. And that's as it stands. So we'll recorded vote. And I'm, I'm calling for a recorded vote because this, the rest of them will be recorded votes. The other ones were referrals and stuff, but I think we should have recorded votes on the rest of these now. Through you, Mr. Mayor. C Councillor Littleton. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Harris. Uh, yes, I guess so. Council, Councilor Garcia. Yes. Councilor Dodge. Yes. Councilor Miller. Yes. Councilor Phillips. Yes. Councilor Porter. No. Councilor Cisco. No. Councilor right. Sorrento. <laughs> Councilor Sorrento. Sorry, no. Councilor Townsend. Yes. Councilor Williamson. Yes. Mayor Senzik. So my dad's gonna call me after this vote, but I'm voting no and he's gonna yell at me. <laughs> and that's carried. Yes. Okay, uh, so moving up on the agenda. So everything else is now in as as amended, so are we comfortable council? Do we wanna vote uh, as, as the block here? We've, re we've removed parts of it, <coughs> parts of it, and now we've got the major. So is, if we're comfortable, I can ask for a vote now. I'm yes. seeing, okay, call the question. 
Through you, Mr. Mayor, for the block, um, Councillor Cisco. Yes. Councillor Sorrento. Yes. Councillor Townsend. Yes. Councillor Williamson. Yes. Councillor Dodge. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Littleton. Yes. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Porter. Yes. And Mayor Senzik. Yes. And that's carried unanimously. Okay, again, thank you staff for all the work that you put into this. It is greatly appreciated and these are new for everybody. So keep up the great work. 3.2 budget standing committee report. Councillor Littleton, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we're uh, bringing forward a motion that was uh, passed unanimously by the budget uh, standing committee. And the reason why I pulled it is really to be transparent and to alleviate any thoughts that the budget standing committee works on its own agenda or tries to hide anything that it passes through. Um, the budget standing committee looked at this issue and our recommendation again was unanimous. I wanna let the council know that being a member of the budget standing committee is a big commitment. It's a lot of meetings. It's probably more meetings than all of the pillar committees combined. And it's a lot of work, it's a lot of prep work, it's a lot of numbers, it's a lot of asking questions, it's a lot of reading reports. And I just, and it's also a lot of stressing. I'm up at two o'clock in the morning because I can't sleep because I'm worried about what we just did, right? And I know that's not a budget as the CAO said, but that's, that's what it's like being on the budget committee. So I, I just want my colleagues to recognize that. When we looked at this issue, we looked at a several reasons why we discussed it. Number one was to be fair and equitable. This is about the cul-de-sacs, just in case anyone doesn't know. So currently the city has 300 cul-de-sacs and we are cutting 36. That's 10% of the cul-de-sacs. That means 90% of residents who have a cul-de-sac on their street have no services for that. And that's unfair. So we have no idea how it came about. The director doesn't have a report that says this is how we got here. I could, you know, philosophize or <laughs> come up with some ideas on how we got here, but regardless, it's unfair. And so of those 36 cul-de-sacs, 17 of them are less than 200 square meters. That is not a large area of, of land. That means we're only cutting 19, 19 cul-de-sacs that are over 200 square meters. The committee felt that 400 square meters was a good size to, be, to create the policy around because 400 square meters represents a large piece of land to be maintained. We heard from some residents on Cascade Court, my colleague, Councillor Miller was talking about them last week as well. Um, and their cul-de-sac is actually 700 square meters. It's very, very large. We can't expect our residents to cut these large pieces of property that, that are our property. And that's what we need to take care of, these large pieces. The second thing we need to look at is cost. If we were to cut all of the costs, this is going back to a March budget standing committee um, report. If we cut them all in the city, it would be $300,000. Friends, we are facing this $10 million shortfall, which we've just, just discussed. And it looks like we're raiding the piggy banks and looking in the couch for the extra money right now to consider adding a service that 90% of residents don't are already taken care of um, is not a good example of good financial management. It's a double negative there, sorry. The report tells you that cutting 400 square meters of cul-de-sacs will cost $9,300. It actually won't because of our discussion that we just had. We are gonna have to call back the unionized staff and not our students who usually perform that work. So the cost is actually $18,600. So if you were to think that we should cut the 200 square meter cul-de-sacs, you're actually asking taxpayers to pay $130,000 to cut cul-de-sacs. And again, 90% of residents in our city don't receive this service. So I think that when the mayor just put up that list that we have, we need to ask ourselves, do we wanna be spending money on cutting cul-de-sacs? Do we wanna open the, adult, the older adult centers? This is a real juggling act that we have to do. I know it's hard to tell people who previously had their cul-de-sacs cut that they won't be done moving forward. I understand that. And I understand that it's difficult to have change. 
but we're elected to make the tough decisions. We just made a tough, we've just made tough decisions. And it's also our job to explain why those decisions are made. And while some people may still be upset about that, I think with reason, they will understand why we're not doing it. I've heard from many people who have said they take turns or a teenager does it. The cul-de-sac for some is an eating place. It's a spot for a lemonade stand, a place to gather with lawn chairs. It's a spot for neighbors to take a dog out and get a little bit of exercise. I know neighbors will take care of these cul-de-sacs. I know it. And I also want to give kudos to Councillor Porter because the other part of this motion is dealing with the environmental impact. And that is really an opportunity for us to get our neighbors to come together to talk about what kind of plants could be worked here with the Green Committee, with others, and really create a neighborhood garden, if you will. If we've declared a climate emergency for our city, it's a skin we must wear. It can't be a cloak we take on and off when we feel like it or when it's convenient. Driving around to various spots with gas powered equipment does nothing to advance our green initiative. I know people are facing hardships due to COVID-19 and they don't want their taxes raised five to 10% for something like cutting of call this ax. Let's pull together as neighbors, let's make a, a policy that's equitable and fair, and let's be financially responsible by passing this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Littleton. I got Councillor uh, Williamson, Councillor Sorrento, and Councillor Townsend. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we went from this being a uh, restoration of $93,000, um, which Councillor Miller, to his credit, uh, brought up and let's let's just remember that this is a kind of an essential service that and, and this debate preceded uh, the whole COVID thing. I think this is the third meeting in a row that we've debated this and we probably do have bigger fish to fry during this crisis. Um, but people for decades and decades since a lot of these subdivisions were built that this has been a service that has been provided um, and speaking of to the the issue of fairness, I don't think it's too late in the day to be pulling the rug out on residents who have uh, expected this, you know, the city to do something that they've done for uh, decades. Um, I, I like the second part of the motion in terms of looking at alternatives. Um, the notion that there's a, a reduced carbon footprint because people pull out their own lawnmowers and take turns cutting um, a giant uh, in many cases, a giant cul-de-sac. I don't think there's any merit in that. Um, sometimes we, we should have state-of-the-art equipment that's doing it um, in, in the most you know, ecologically friendly way possible. Um, and then, of course, we have our favorite metric system. And we, in, in the old days, 400 square meters was 4,306 square feet. And uh, those of us who've been around for a while, um, we'll still think of things in square feet, and it's um, when, when you think of it as 4,300 square feet as the minimum that's going to be cut. To me, that's just uh, that's asking far too much, and uh, just using a straight number as the criteria also is a pretty narrow way to look at it. I think there's other considerations here. You have uh, there are courts, and, and to a lot of, uh, a lot of people's credit, where they share and they get the job done. But there's other places where people are physically disabled; they have other issues. They're not able to do it. So we have to consider that speaking of the human aspect of, of decisions. I think we have to, to look at that. Um, so uh, we have gone around this a whole lot. Uh, Councillor Christian will remember the name of the city, former city treasurer who used to say that every night is budget night. Of course, this is a night, not even a meeting, but every meeting is a budget meeting. We have to make decisions on budget um, on a nightly basis. But this is a, a service that was offered is now being cut. So it represents a cut and I'm not in favor of a cut. I don't think anybody around here got elected not saying they were going to cut essential services to residents. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Williamson. Councillor Townsend, you're up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, uh, I share a similar um, mindset to uh, Councillor Williamson. Um, we, you know, we were called citizens first down at City Hall for a reason, and this was, uh, this is a service that I think we have a responsibility and to look at someone to cut, um, you know, 4,000 say square feet. Uh, I can't, I can't see a community with all due respect to community 
uh, coming together to cut that, especially if it's, a, if it's an area or a cul-de-sac that uh, has an elder, elderly population, older, older resident population. So that, uh, that does concern me. As for the climate emergency, yeah, we have declared a climate emergency, but we, we also, uh, from what I would understand as a city, uh, we would have uh, state-of-the-art technology, up-to-date equipment that should be uh, what, you know, what green environmental techno um, um, tools uh, should look like. You know, if, if this is, you know, climate, we bring up the climate emergency, fine, but at the end of the day, do we not have state-of-the-art equipment that is up-to-date? What, what, how old is the equipment that we use? Like, that's one thing that, you know, uh, are we decreasing property taxes? Is that one thing that we're going to be doing? No, we're not. So I think we have an obligation here uh, to provide this service to residents. Uh, and that's, uh, I won't be supporting, I, I have an amendment that I, I, I will like, I, that I would like to make. I'm not sure if this is the time to do it, but if it is, I, I'd be more than willing to put it on the table. Uh, and if it's if it's a change to the square meters, then it's it's not an amendment. You'll have this has to be defeated first. Okay, then uh, I'll wait for that. Then thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Councillor Townsend, Councillor Sorrento. No, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. My question is for uh, Director Smith. Uh, Director Smith, the cul-de-sac report, where where I think it, the service was pulled out of. Uh, Pulled out of budget. Was that in 2006, Director? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the original report was in 2006, which ceased the, the cul-de-sac cutting service at okay. that time. Okay, thank you. Well, I certainly hope that uh, my colleagues who are on council in 2006 can tell us why, why or how that got pulled out of the budget. So um, I am going to be supporting Councillor Wilton's, uh, Councillor Wilton's uh, amendment, okay? Mr. Mayor, and I do have some more questions for, for the director as well. Um, for the last term and, and a half, we, we as a council have really ground down uh, the, the budget through our staff to, to do more with less. It, it's finally coming back to haunt us now through this COVID. Uh, I've only lived through seven years of, the, uh, of this and my, there are some of my colleagues who have lived through it a lot a lot longer than I have, but I seem to recall, you know, grind, 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 get it down, get it down. Well, if you want services, we got to pay for them. That's, that's, that's the bottom line as far as that goes. So it's a double-edged sword, Mr. Mayor. So questions to the director regarding the staff. Now, Director Smith, uh, are you short? Can, can you tell us how many staff you are short in terms of being able to provide this service in your department? Uh through you, Mr. Mayor, um, this service specifically or just short in general from what we had last year? Short, short in general, Director Smith, because it's gonna be, it's gonna affect you, the, the service levels. So through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, we have about 120 less temporary seasonal staff and uh, students we also have 11 full-time vacancies that we have not filled to try to help uh, control, again, the deficit from this pandemic. And, and Mr. Mayor, uh, through you to Director Smith, and are we not also short, sir, about 130 part-time or casual employees in addition to the numbers that you've mentioned of, of reduced staff? Through you, Mr. Mayor, there is, uh, yes, that reduction in part-time employees, but they are not part of this program in municipal works. Okay. Now, are you, Mr. Mayor, through you to Director Smith, are you aware of any other municipalities or parkways where the grass is not being cut due to COVID and due to, to, to uh, uh, reduce staff? Can you give us examples of them? Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, there are several areas where decisions have been made to reduce the level of service. Niagara Parks is one of them. Uh, yeah. Most of the neighboring municipalities have some level of reduced service. Um, obviously, each municipality, Niagara Parks, they were all going to make those, these decisions based on their operational capabilities which is what we've done. We, we put a, a program in place based on the operational capabilities that we possess right at this moment. Okay, so it, Mr. Mayor, through you to Director Smith, in short, would it be a fair and accurate statement to say that really at this point, you don't have enough staff to cut these, the, the current complement of, of uh, cul-de-sacs uh, 
you know, even once every two months or once every six weeks. Is that a fair statement? Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. So uh, if it becomes a bylaw cut, what happens? So the grass gets so long that it actually contravenes our bylaw. At this point, what we do is we put that on a list. And as we manage our programs uh, and we work through and get efficiencies, we'll get around to cutting them. But what we can't do at this point is promise what that level of service is. Uh, so we do our best to conform and uh, we work our best to become efficient at it, but without actually bringing dedicated bodies back on to do this, we would not be able to guarantee a level of service. And, to, and Mr. Mayor, to you, to Director Smith, to uh, Councillor uh, Littleton's point, we are obligated to bring back our full-time employees uh, instead of students, correct? Because of the CBA, is that correct? Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. Uh, subject to the um, motion that was passed previously by this council, so we will be in touch with our unions, but as it stands right now, we are obligated to bring full-time staff back. Okay, and another question is, where would you prioritize the cul-de-sac cuttings, Director Smith, in relation to all of the other obligations that you have in terms of a service delivery to this community? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, just dealing with the park side. So we'll leave the roads and, and sewer water relevant for this moment because it's two different skill sets. Uh, just on the park side, our number one priority uh, would be sports fields and passive parks for the use of the people. Uh, beaches would come close to that because as we're getting into the hot weather and the mayor has already alluded to, people are going to have uh, uh, a need to do that. After that, it would go down to the cemeteries, um, then the golf course, and to be quite honest, cul-de-sacs would be right at the bottom of the list. Councillor, you're muted. Mayor, Mayor. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I apologize. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be brief and wrap it up. Mr. Mayor, I live in a cul-de-sac. There's a senior who has been cutting, well, not a senior, but the neighbors have been cutting it, Mr. Mayor, for over 40 years. My boulevard is bigger than the cul-de-sac. I believe your parents live one, one house down from a cul-de-sac, Mr. Mayor. Perhaps my colleagues were, that were here in 2006 can enlighten the rest of the council and let us know what happened. So I will be supporting Councillor uh, Littleton's motion. Thank you so much. And thank you to our team for all your hard work and the directors. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I got Councillor Phillips, uh, Councillor Porter, Councillor Garcia, Councillor Cisco. So if we can, we still have a lot more to do on council night. So let's try and move through this. Councillor Phillips, I believe you're up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just quickly to, uh, Director Smith, uh, obviously with the uh, concerns about ticks and, and Lyme disease, um, the height of grass is, is a concern anywhere. Uh, as far as the cul-de-sacs are concerned, if residents are not able to, and they're smaller than 400 square meters, uh, if they're not able to do that and it gets high, what's the situ what do they do? What's the situation uh, in, in regards to uh, your service? You kind of alluded to that with Councillor Sorrento, but could you expand upon, the, upon it a little bit? How do they get it cut? So through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, at, at some point, the grass would become a contravention to our bylaw and it would go on a list for bylaw cuts. In previous years, when we had significant, the staff members here, uh, bylaw cuts were carried out monthly uh, so that there was uh, to make sure that all the properties complied. That's not feasible with the staffing levels we have. So what happens when a property is deemed out of compliance with the bylaw, it gets added to a bylaw cut list and we do it as we can make re free resources to do it. Um, and that comes through myself and the managers managing the programs to try to maximize the ability to respond to all the various demands. Um, one of the things that we have done with the creation of municipal works is we've been able to trade our workforces back and forth between road operations and parks operations, which helps uh, manage some of those peaks and uh, valleys in that system. And we would continue to 
uh, challenge our managers and supervisors to find ways to, to do that efficiently. Thank you, Director. As our former Director of Recreation, Rick Lane used to say, sounds like we have to do more with less. Thank you. Councilor, Councilor Porter, sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Are we um, discussing the motion right now? I just don't see it on a screen. Yeah, motion's on the floor, sorry. I've been put that on. Okay. Um, I do have, I think I have an, a bit of an addition to that. Is that my friendly amendment? I have to check, yep. sorry. Yep, it is. I thought I wrote more. I thought I was wordier than that. Um, I, my amendment included um, going to the Green Advisory Committee, um, using Engage STC also, um, and yeah, that's not my friendly amendment. Give me one second. I, I, I believe I sent it to the clerk's office. I'm saying friendly, I'm not sure if it's friendly yet. Um, yeah. And it is that staff be directed to consult with the green committee, environmental groups, horticulturists on staff and the community through Engage STC in a program that would align with council's declaration of a climate emergency and support neighbors living on cul-de-sacs to make choices from a variety of bee-friendly landscaping options that would improve carbon sequestration and reduce the need for frequent mowing. Um, and that would include options, for example, like clover, um, partial naturalization, I wrote nationalization, partial, partial naturalization to reduce the turf mowing area, trees, shrub, shrubs, et cetera. And that staff prepare a report and budget in advance of the 2021 budget deliberations. Um, and that staff also research and recommend potential sources of external funding for such an initiative, like uh, through TD Friends of the Environment, or um, maybe some project funding through the Federation of Canadian Mis Municipalities. Um, I did email this to the clerk's office, I, um, or to the clerks at, to their uh, email address uh, this morning at 11. Um, and I'm hoping that council will support this. We're talking, we, we're spending a lot of time talking about this as a cut, and I see that we, we actually need to make some changes after we declare um, a climate emergency. Sometimes it involves uh, changes and choices, and um, I think that we need to ask people who live on cul-de-sacs, um, it should be their choice if they want clover or something else, um, that they work with the city to plant something different so we don't have to mow as much. I believe that this is this program will still cost some kind of money and will require a budget. It's not going to cost nine thousand um, dollars, and there will be some maintenance involved. But I believe we need to ask people who live on cul-de-sacs, and we need to ask residents to help us keep taxes low, um, help us if we can prevent uh, getting a truck to deliver a lawnmower to mow um, a small piece of grass by the city. If they can find some other way of doing it, we are um, we are helping with our climate uh, targets. Um, so I'm hoping that council can support this and that staff can find a way um, to come up with some kind of program, not not a program that we impose on the neighbors, but one that they can kind of buy into themselves, um, and they can have a few choices if they choose to. Uh, go to Clover or some naturalization. Um, does, do the, does the clerk's office need me to send this amendment? Yeah, I think I think if you can send it again, Evan, can you just give her the email address just in case? I'll send can. it to Evan and uh, Bonnie. Yeah, if you could send it directly to myself and Bonnie right now, then I'll put it up on the motion screen here. Okay. okay. Let's hold that and let's go to, I had my list of hands up. Um, I believe I have Councillor uh, Councillor Miller, you're on the list. I can see your hand, Councillor Cisco. So let's go to Councillor Miller. Thanks. I just had a couple questions to start off with staff. I guess um, I guess start with with uh, 
three of them are to, to legal. What are, uh, what's our protection here in terms of those 90% as Councilor Littleton alluded to that are being cut and, you know, would that change if we're sort of de facto, not just encouraging, but expecting citizens to, to head out with heavy machinery? Do we have, are we covered for, for injuries and things that can be sustained there? Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, the city, these individuals are not covered by the city's insurance, but the city's insurance responds to any claims, but there's nothing related to the decision before council today that, in my opinion, would change the city's risk exposure in any meaningful way. So if someone right now, let's say on those 270, whatever it is, that get cut, gets hurt, are we liable? Well, certainly we're liable. I mean, how, what's the likelihood you think of damages being being awarded against the city? Three, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. I mean, the city has exposure for injuries which occur on city property at all times for any reason uh, that the, the resident would be on city property. So if a resident is on city property and they suffer an injury, um, you know, determining the city's exposure to liability is an assessment of whether or not there was any negligence of the city that contributed to that, to that injury. So nothing related to this discussion changes that, um, you know, the purpose that the citizen was there wouldn't, wouldn't change that assessment. Okay, fair enough. Uh, and just to, I guess now it's for you the mayor to, um, to Mr. Smith, the, to the point that these get done anyway if we don't cut them basically right if if a neighborhood just said you know it's 200 square meters or 350 and and so what we're not going to do it we can wait the the six weeks until it's too high i mean what's what's the risk there you know of, of all those ones especially those bigger ones but obviously it could happen on smaller circles too um where that cost could become significant or the list could become so large that, that we're simply not able to do it because we haven't hired enough people back. I mean, is that, is that something you've examined when, when sort of preparing these reports? Through uh, you, Mr. Mayor. So first off, overwhelmingly private people are doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't anticipate that any decision that is made at council will substantially change that because many people will want to maintain their cul-de-sac to a higher level than the city will maintain it. So the city's purpose in going to a cul-de-sac is just controlling the height of grass and controlling any weeds, period. So we're not trying to make it a manicured area for people to play in or people to use. However, there are people that wanna do that and because they want to do that, that's why they maintain the cul-de-sac. With respect to this year and the staffing levels we have, as I, as I stated before, it would get put on a list and we would get to it when we could on that list. That may be six weeks, that may be eight weeks. At this point, I cannot uh, guarantee how long it will be. Uh, obviously this time of year, as the grass grows quicker, um, it's, it's going to get longer before we're going to get there. Through the summer, as the grass growth rate slows down, uh, we don't anticipate that it'll be as much of a problem. Um, but at this point, I can't make any guarantees with respect to time frames. I guess, I, you know, that's my concern is we're saying it's $18,000 to do the 400 meter square, but that, that's sort of an estimate and uh, it could end up being a lot higher, uh, you know, depending on, on what happens. And I think the other thing to keep in mind is that there are, circles that we're cutting right now that are far smaller than this that will now not be cut that I think there we shouldn't really expect residents who haven't been cutting them for decades to, to just go out there and do it so uh, I'm, I'm worried that we say 18,000 and that should be a lot uh, a lot higher than that just last question for director Smith um, with regards to non-cut maintenance I know Cascade Court in particular the residents have had some issues with the with the cul-de-sac itself in terms of holes or uneven surfaces, things like that. I mean, how often are we inspecting both the ones we cut and the ones we don't cut um, for safety concerns like that? Again, as people are heading out with heavy machinery on these things. So through you, Mr. Mayor, there is first off no requirement because the cul-de-sac island is not 
designated a public access space. So there's no requirement under minimum maintenance standards that we inspect that space or repair that space. Having said that, if we are aware of a situation that is unsafe, we will obviously take action to try to remedy that. Um, with one of the things that goes around with our staff cutting the cul-de-sacs is we do get to see the ones that we cut. And if we do see a situation that needs to be addressed, we will address it. But there is no formal program for inspecting cul-de-sacs. Uh, it's just done through, uh, mostly through uh, people calling in with a concern. Okay, uh, thank you. And I think just with regards to this, the motion, I, you know, I think the second half is obviously a slam dunk. Uh, you know, we need a long-term plan for these cul-de-sacs. You know, I don't think anyone needs to, to tell to tell me about that or or, or worry about climate change. As and Councillor Williamson would be in that boat too, as as two of the people most in tune on this council with climate change. So I think that part's pretty easy, and I, I certainly would expect that to get the support. I think my concern about the first part is is uh, you know, it's, it's, we're not really addressing the issue. We're, we are still ultimately responsible for these. Um, having said that, I will probably support it because like I said earlier, I've said the word cul-de-sac about 60 times in the last two months and I, I'm pretty tired of it. And uh, I certainly would be happy for my residents at Cascade Court to get this done. So that is, this is the simplest way to do it. Uh, and certainly look forward to that sort of long-term plan for these things. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Uh, now we have Councillor Cisco and then Councillor Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and hopefully I don't sound too robotic as this uh, as this uh, goes on. Uh, I will applaud Councillor Miller uh, in that he mentioned that he has said the words cul-de-sac too much. I have typed the words cul-de-sac too much, and I look forward to not doing it as well. Uh, I'll be supporting the motion uh, as it stands. Uh, I think we had a good debate at the Budget Committee, and I appreciate all of the input. Um, I will just I will just say the the point's been made that this has been going on since before COVID and and that is that is fair, uh, but we also are in a very different environment and we looked at a number of services that uh, we are either going to be returning to or not returning to this year and there are some services and service levels that and many in the community would consider to be vital that that we're not going to be getting to this year it is a different time. Uh, I will point out, and I think it's important, a, a lot of uh, talk about the fact that cul-de-sacs are city property, but uh, boulevards are city property as well. And, and we expect residents to cut those. And I know that there are instances uh, in my own neighborhood where there are very large boulevards, you know, into the hundreds of meters square uh, that residents derive no benefit from that are along sides of the house and run along main streets that they're responsible for cutting. Uh, these changes were made, I believe, actually in 1994 I think it was in 2006 that it was decided not to uh, go back to cutting all of the cul-de-sacs and many of the boulevards in the city. Uh, and I, 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 this is, while some folks have been receiving the service, uh, the reality is that this was not something that we were supposed to be doing. I think we've struck a balance uh, to the point that has been made about the very large, uh, large area cul-de-sacs like Cascade Court. Uh, I think we struck a balance and we are going to be taking care of those because in instances like that, you know, we're talking about, I believe in that case, it was eight properties long. I mean, that's a very large area. Uh, but when we talk about properties under 400 square meters, I mean, you're talking about cul-de-sacs that are only one or two properties wide. Uh, and in some cases, uh, they're less than that. I believe the original report that came to the budget committee in March talked about cul-de-sacs that were as small as seven square meters. Um, so I would encourage everybody to, to pass the motion that Councillor Littleton has come forward and that's been amended by uh, Councillor Porter because I think the point stands as well that ultimately we should be looking for uh, more environmental uh, cut ground coverings uh, going forward. I think in the long term that will create a cost savings to a certain extent, although it obviously won't be initially, uh, but it is more environmentally friendly and uh, ultimately I think that's where we have to be moving these services. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cisco and Councillor Garcia for the last, hopefully the last comment on cul-de-sacs. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I certainly support the intent of both of those motions and the amendments, but <clears throat> I am very concerned that uh, when we talk about fairness, that uh, we have a lot of cul-de-sacs that have been cut in the past. And uh, I get emails from people I'm familiar with, for example, in Port Master, where people that live there are now Two are in their 90s and the others are seniors and they just can't do it. So 
I would like to uh, bring back the uh, motion that uh, Councillor Miller had at the last meeting and recommend and I an amendment that uh, I sent to Evan, but essentially says that uh, <clears throat> that we restore the level of service that was provided in the past years. And <clears throat> I suspect that many of these called this act that we were cutting, we were cutting because of similar situations where people could not do it and the people that can will do it. So <clears throat> I don't think we're being fair to those residents and I don't think they should have to wait until the grass grows way long in order to get it done. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. So it's um, I, um, that's not a that's not an amendment that you can make. It's contrary to the motion that's on the floor. So that won't be a motion that we can entertain now. We'll have to vote on this one first, and then we could um, if there if Council doesn't agree with this, then we move on to another motion. But uh, that won't be a motion that will be on the floor currently. I'm I'm sorry, but is that not an amendment, Mr. Mayor? Uh, it's that would be contrary to the. <coughs> motion that's in front of us on the first point so you're asking to add something and that's contrary to actually the motion that has been brought forward so that one just has to be dealt with first counselor and then if this one is is not approved then you go to you can bring up another motion okay Okay, so we've got the information, Councillor Phil Williamson. You've already spoken, so. Well, just just a, a point of order. If I could just ask for the uh, it to be split between the first section and the rest. Okay, so we'll deal with the first one. Uh, we'll deal with the first one first because that's the, the 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 I think the contentious one. The second one should go through no problem. So I'll look to the clerk to call the question. Sorry, point of order, Mr. Mayor. Just a quick question. Yeah. Uh, am I, I just want to ask, am I able to add one small thing into the, the part that uh, Councillor Porter added? Um, can we wait until uh, we deal with that one, Councillor? Okay, thank you. Okay, to the clerk. On the first part of the motion, Councillor Littleton. Yes. Councillor Kushner. No. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Garcia. No. Councillor Dodge. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Councillor Miller. Uh, no. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Porter. Yes. Councillor Cisco. Yes. Councillor Sorrento. Yes. Councillor Townsend. No. Councillor Williamson? No. And Mayor Senzik? Yes. And that's carried. Okay, thank you for that, Council. Now we'll go to the second one, which I'm sure there will be unanimous support, uh, but we'll do a call a question on that one too. Oh, sorry, Councillor Townsend. You got yes. A small amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you, just I wanted to see just after shrubs, if we can add in eco lawn, please, as an as an alternative um, solution here. Would that be friendly? Is that, a friendly? that is friendly. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Townsend, do you have a seconder? Uh, I'll second it. Thank I'll you. Second. Here. Thank you. All in favor of that? Oh. That's just the amendment to the clerk. That's just the amendment, right? Yeah. Okay. We'll uh, now we'll vote on the second half of the motion. Okay. Let's vote on the second half. Moved by this is moved by Councillor Porter. Okay. Ca uh, Councillor Dodge. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Littleton. Yes. Councillor Miller. Yep. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Porter? Yes. Councillor Cisco? Yes. Councillor Sorrento? Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. And Mayor Senzik? Yes. Carried unanimously. Okay, so we'll go to 3.3, Councillor Miller, and this is a council correspondence sub item three. 
and this is again a to endorse a, a resolution so if we can we still have a lot of a work in front of us so um i'll leave it to councillor miller if you can set the table and maybe we can just move on this quickly yeah this is pretty straightforward uh city of kitchener is asking uh upper levels of government to uh to endorse uh the establishment of universal basic income. So all I'm asking is that we do the same and it's uh, seconded by Councillor Cisco. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Is there any pressing need to make a comment? I think this is pretty um, universal in its design. I know yeah, Senator Siegel, a uh, longtime conservative has been pushing this forever. Um, so there's a lot of cross party uh, <coughs> this kind of initiative. So if not, I'll just call the question and go to the clerk. Hear you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Councillor Porter. Yes. Councillor Cisco. Yes. Councillor Sorrento. Agenda, agenda, see. Yes. <laughs> Councillor Townsend. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Councillor Williamson. Yes. Councillor Littleton. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Dodge. Yes. And Mayor Senzik. Yes, and I'll, I'll add that it is Italian Heritage Month, so I'll let <laughs> Councillor surrender. <laughs> Carried unanimously. In a, in a different way. Um, okay, so 3.4, we have uh, a consent item that was moved for discussion, and really, uh, Councillor had to set the table. It's just adding a, a, a something to it in terms of what would be more of a marketing opportunity. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, moved the uh, recommendation, just adding those three words. Um, the public vote on naming was uh, obviously fairly conclusive. Neil Perch done probably one of our most famous uh, local individuals and a lot of the songs uh, uh, have local roots, including the, uh, the namesake park. And uh, so, I think this just adds and identifies the fact that it's the setting uh, is in Lakeside Park, also the name of his famous song. So hopefully this goes through unanimously. And that Councillor uh, Garcia, I think, is seconding. Okay, thank you. And I, I think if um, I'll look to the Director of Economic Development Tourism, I think the intention here is that on the pavilion, it'll be the Neil Peer Pavilion. And then the way it's marketed and the way that it's, it's um, put into the community is it'll always be referred to as Neil Pier Pavilion at Lakeside Park. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I think you meant the director of CRCS? Oh, no, from a tourism perspective. Oh, certainly, yes, of course. Like it's, so there's, there's a marketing opportunity here as well. Yes, certainly. Okay. So if there's no other questions in this, call the question. Through you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Williamson. Yes. Councillor Townsend. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Sorrento? Yes. Councillor Cisco? Yes. Councillor Porter? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor Littleton? Yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. And Mayor Senzik? Yes, uh, unanimously. I just like to thank the staff that worked on this. Uh, Phil Christie and his team did a did a very good job communicating with the public and engaging the public through Engage STC, and uh, they put a lot of work into it. So I just want to say thank you on behalf of council for all that work. Uh, we go on to what is now council has reconvened. Motion to ratify uh, forthwith recommendations, and we have. Councillor Garcia, who's adopting that council adopt those items approved forthwith by general committee on Wednesday, June 3rd, 2020. Moved by Councillor Garcia, correct? And just wait. Yes. yes. Seconded by Councillor uh, Williamson. Yes. Yes. Okay. And all in favor? Hands up. All right. That's carried. And motions, which is the city council meeting schedule. Okay, so we have the, the meeting schedule, which is being revised. And the basis of this, folks, is that uh, we'll be returning to Monday, uh, beginning June 22nd, Monday, June 22nd, and that 
The meetings will continue to be held in this electronic format at the discretion of the CAO. And that it be further resolved that it will be a six o'clock start on the Mondays, that the additional meetings should be necessary, also approved. So this is July 27th and Monday, August 24th. So we're adding a July meeting because I think we're gonna be still having to make a lot of tough decisions around uh, where we're going to be either opening service <clears throat> or not. So this is what's in front of us. Councillor Deputy Mayor Dodge has made this motion and I need a seconder. Councillor Lilton, thank you. Is there any, any comments on this meeting schedule? Councillor Miller. Just, I guess, if I could just ask three of them or the CAO, I mean, does staff, I, I would have thought the sort of daytime meetings were better for staff and it fit more sort of right schedule or, or do they have any, I guess, opinion on this, uh, on, on when we're having these, these meetings? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, certainly this one doesn't feel like a daytime meeting anymore. But, uh, <laughs> But uh, it, in the beginning of the, when we were going through this crisis, staff were on pretty much seven days a week. And so the Wednesday meeting worked better from taking things away from the weekend, gave us a chance to have not as much reach outs on the weekend. Um, while we're still, you know, putting significant hours in, it's come to a little bit more normalcy now. So going back to the Monday and the time, I think is appropriate. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Miller. Councillor uh, Councillor Porter has her hand up. Yes, um, I have a new job and I can't really meet in the day. It's a real challenge, so I'm I'm hoping that we can move it to the evening. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, uh, show of hands for this one. All in favor? Okay, that's carried. Thank you. Uh, Ten point two, and this is the. Appointment of Councillor Dodge as Director, Large Urban Caucus for the AMO Board of Directors. Uh, so we have a motion in front of us on the screen and moved by Councillor Phillips. And we need a seconder for this. Councillor Porter, thank you. And that City Council support the appointment of Councillor Don Dodge to the Associated Municipalities of Ontario AM AMO Board of Directors, Large Urban Caucus for the duration of the 2018-2022 term of St. Catherine City Council. At the cost, Council Dodge, the AMO board, and then the clerk passed the resolution on to the AMO board in advance of the meeting. So, any other questions on this? Hey, Councillor Dodge, right. you know, stay right. job, so. go take a look at him. Uh, I'll mute that. There you go. Uh, Councillor Councillor Dodge has done an amazing job, and I'm laughing because Councillor Williamson was talking, and he, well, he was still mute. He was unmuted. <laughs> I muted you. Don't worry, you're done. I muted you. Uh, Councillor Dodge has done a, a great job keeping us informed and, and I can say that uh, I've got other friends who are on the AMO board who speak very highly of Don's contributions. He's representing our city very well. So I'll call the question, show of hands. All in favor? Congratulations, Councillor Dodge. And this appointment will hopefully carry through to 2022. Okay, um, for the next one we have, did I turn the page too quick? Yep, it's 10.3, uh, and I'll turn it over to Councillor Cisco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the motion, whereas the topic of body cameras for police officers in Niagara has been discussed in the past, and whereas in 2018, the NRP indicated in a St. Catherine Standard article that they were deferring to a Toronto Police Services study on the issue. Whereas since that time, there have been instances where body cameras on police officers would have been useful in determining what exactly had taken place during confrontation. Therefore, be it resolved, the Catherine City Council call on the Niagara Region through the Police Services Board to immediately begin the process of procuring and outfitting officers with body cameras. And be it further resolved that this motion be forwarded to all local municipalities, the offices of all Niagara area MPPs and MPs, and the offices of the Attorney General of Ontario, Doug Downey, the Attorney General of Canada, David Lametti, Ontario Public Safety Minister Sylvia Jones and Federal Public Safety Minister Bill Blair. And I'm just gonna to speak to this very briefly uh, because I believe there will be a referral to the uh, city's anti-racism committee. Um, uh, I put this out uh, given a lot of what's going on in, the, uh, in North America right now, but the Canadian context as well as the American context, uh, it's something that uh, people have reached out and talked to me about and have asked me to use what is a position of privilege being a member of city council to advocate for this. And uh, one of the roles of city councillors, even though this is a regional 
uh, obviously a regional issue. One of the jobs of this, our, our council is to advocate for what our residents are bringing forward. And so, you know, having the position of priv privilege on council, uh, I have the ability to put forward advocacy efforts like this. Uh, since this, uh, the agenda has been published, uh, I've had people reach out and indicate uh, their belief that there are other areas uh, that we also need to be looking at, things like de-escalation training, uh, community oversight or further community oversight, uh, and giving racialized communities more, uh, more opportunity to comment, um, different types of community representation, things like demilitarization of the police force. I know Councilor Miller feels very passionately about some of these issues as well. Uh, so I believe we have an opportunity here uh, and as I said, uh, I, I know that there is a referral coming to the anti-racism committee uh, to go to that committee and uh, determine what can be part of a more comprehensive motion to move forward to the region, because I think we have an opportunity right now to have those voices heard. Uh, and I think it's incumbent on all of us to use what is our position of privilege on this council to, uh, to advocate for our community. Thank you, Councillor Cisco. I'm going to go to Councillor Porter. Yes, I would like to make the motion to refer to the city's anti-racism committee. Okay, that's a referral and uh, to the to the clerk, the anti-racism committee, you've been in contact with them about uh, getting them onto the electronic format? That's correct. They plan to meet shortly. Okay, so this is this is good timing for that. Okay, so that's a referral. Can we motion to refer? Mr. Mayor? Yeah, we yep. can't. Can't debate yeah. a referral. Well, I, I just, in terms of who's being circulated, I, it, it seems that we need to uh, include our chief of police, the Niagara Regional Police, Niagara Regional Police Service Board, Niagara Regional Police Association, and I think Niagara Regional Council as well, since this is, uh, you know, their responsibility primarily. Okay, so when that comes back to us, we'll look at the language around that. So nothing's going to be circulated until uh, it comes back from the anti-racism committee. Okay. Okay, all in favor of the referral? Opposed? Okay, it's carried. Thank you, Councillor Cisco, for that. And um, we should have that back probably within the next six weeks after the next meeting of the Council of the uh, Anti-Racism Committee. In addition to that, the um, LGBTQ2+, and the Equity and, and Inclusion Committees, I think are also going to be meeting soon uh, our city clerk has reached out to them as well to get them on the electronic format as well, just to provide an update. Okay, uh, calls for notices of motion. Can I um, can I move the notices? Can we go to, let's do the in-camera and then when we come out of in-camera, we'll go to the notices of motion. And because we still have a lot of work in the in-camera stuff. So I'd like to go to that first. So I'm going to look to the clerk for the reasons to go in-camera and... Where's the clerk? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Here I am. Okay. Um, a motion to go in camera for a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board regarding a report request from a counselor. Advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose regarding general committee agenda item 2.4 sub item 8 council correspondence letter from coalition for a better St. Catharines regarding the former General Motors lands and the disclaimer. Uh, by attending the in-camera session, each member of council acknowledges that their obligations under the code of conduct, including responsibilities related to the confidentiality of closed session materials and discussions remain the same as if they were physically present at this meeting. This includes the, that members of council are not permitted to record the proceedings and that they must ensure that no other person can see or hear any of the conf confidential deliberations taking place. Thank you. Mr. Mayor? Yep. Sorry, I would like some clarification before we go on camera, please. Okay. Uh, I ask that we pull that uh, uh, submission from the coalition and I had a motion on it. And now we're gonna talk about talking about it in camera. I would like the city solicitor to tell us why do we have to discuss that particular item in camera when it's part of the public agenda that everybody has read? Okay, um, I'll go. I'll go to. So, I'll go to the director of legal. But I, I think it's important that we go in camera first to hear. Like, so director, the, the director Salter will provide an answer to that, uh, Councillor Garcia. But I, I think you'll understand the rationale. 
I don't understand it in that part, Mr. Mayor, but that's okay. Okay, Director Salter. Thank you. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, my understanding is the request uh, to go in camera with respect to the correspondence was to receive a legal opinion with respect to the allegations made in the letter. For that reason, it would be going in camera to receive solicitor client's advice. So when we come out, Councillor Garcia, I think it'd be fair to ask that question. Okay, I, I do. I, I, it's a fair question, but I think it'd be better asked after we come out of in camera. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I will do so. Okay, thank you. Uh, we got a couple hands. Okay, are, are these all we got hands up, but our Councillor Porter. Councillor Phillips, you have your hands up. Are you are you asking something? Okay, I'll lower your hand. Councillor Williamson, are you asking anything right now? Are you going to wait? No question. Okay, so motion to go in camera. All in favor? Okay, that's carried. And just before we go, folks, Evan, can you again tell us what's going to happen so the public knows what's going to happen as well? Yep, certainly, Mr. Mayor. So what's going to happen is in a moment, I will open out the, uh, the breakout room and all of the members of council and yourself and some members of city staff will move to that breakout room. Uh, myself and some other city staffers will remain here in the main meeting room. Those watching on YouTube will remain here in the main meeting room. And just for um, uh, the public's awareness, we'll be putting up a message on the screen that says that council is in a closed session. And then when the uh, closed session is complete, everyone will come back to this main meeting room. Okay, thank you, Evan. Okay, so let's figure out how do we do this virtual march to the next room. Hey, Evan. Hey, Brian. So we're still on YouTube right now, Brian. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I've got the, the share screen message up, but uh, audio is still there.
council back in the room. So we are now back. Council is reconvened. We are back in public session. And we're going now through motions arising from in-camera session. So uh, if, if Evan can put on the screen, if possible. Uh, got the motions. This is the first motion. And a report request from a councillor in camera pursuant to bylaw 215-170 as amended. Section 20, B23C, a proposed depending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. And then the motion is that staff prepare a report as directed during the in council in camera discussion. So I'll look to the clerk to call the vote. For you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Porter. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Uh, yeah, uh, no. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Littleton. Yes. Councillor Kushner. No. Councillor Harris. No. Councillor Garcia. No. Councillor Dodge. No. Councillor Cisco. Yes. Councillor Sorrento. No. Councillor Townsend. Yes. Councillor Williamson. No. And Mayor Sensick. Mayor Sensick. Mayor Sensick, are you in the room? Yeah, if you could look, um, I'm off mute. Can you see it? Well, there you go. Now there you're you on. There you are. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Just calling for calling the vote. Yep. In favor. Okay. And the the motion lost seven to six. On the screen, Evan. <clears throat> General committee agenda item 2.4 sub item eight council correspondence letter from coalition for a better St. Catharines regarding the former GM site uh, that council received and filed the information of correspondence from the coalition for a better St. Catharines regarding the former general Moore's land and that council received the advice in camera uh, by the solicitor. This is just to receive the advice. Okay. And there will be a motion after this one. There'll be the yeah. motion that okay. uh, I believe is going to be probably a show of hands on this one. Sure. All There's in favor. All... Can you count them for me, please? Can't see them. Oh, over here. Sorry. I think we got it. It's a majority. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Carrie. Uh, thank you, Evan. You're not you're on the next one. And so this will be the last one coming from in camera. So I'll have to read this one and I'll have Evan type it. Um, that legal be directed to issue a statement of, of the process and content uh, which would be considered by legal to the Coalition for a Better St. Catharines. I think that captures what Councillor uh, Councillor Kushner put on the floor. Okay, I guess that's, that's clear enough. Okay, through you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Dodge. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Littleton. Yes. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Porter. Councillor Porter. Councillor Cisco. Sorry. Councillor yes. Cisco. You said yes. Thank you. Councillor Cisco. Cisco. Councillor Cisco. I hate what? technology. I hate technology and yes. Okay. Councillor Sorrento. 
Yes. Councilor Townsend. Yes. Councilor Williamson. Yes. And Mayor Senzik. Yes. And that's carried unanimously. Okay, so um, before we head into the reading of the bylaws and we end the meeting, I just got to go back to um, notice of motions. Notice of motions. Perfect. Uh, 11.5. <clears throat> I guess uh, my question is is Anthony still on? Anthony Martuccio? Yeah, he's still on. I just maybe before I do this, I would like to ask a question because this, the actual. Uh, reconstruction of uh, Highland and South Drive is underway. So I'm not sure if we have enough time to do a notice motion or do we need to waive the rules to try and uh, delete certain sidewalks. So maybe through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, <clears throat> the Director of Engineering. Through you, Mr. Mayor, the uh, reconstruction work uh, in, on South Drive in the <coughs> Glen Ridge area has commenced the contractors First street for construction is South Drive um, and they will be progressing with work uh, or they are progressing with work right now. Um, we have asked them to hold off on some works. However, uh, three weeks delay would, would uh, cause significant delay and potential cost to the project. Okay, well then could I perhaps ask if council could we could waive the rules and actually address this right now? Okay, so Mr. Mayor. I'll look to the clerk. I think it needs a two thirds to waive the rules. Yes. Okay. So there's a request to waive the rules for just for consideration. You're not voting on the, the subject matter. Um, so I'll, we'll need nine. Okay. I'll look to the clerk. I'll call the question because I think we need, I'm not going to do a show of hands. This is a call question. This is a big subject matter, but. Okay, go. Where are you, Mr. Mayor? Councillor Dodge. <clears throat> Councillor Dodge. Sorry, yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Littleton. Yes. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Porter. No. Councillor Cisco. Councillor. Yes. Councillor Sorrento. Yes. Councillor Townsend. Yes. Councillor Williamson. Yes. And Mayor Senzik. Mayor Senzik. Mayor Senzik. On. Can you guys not see that I'm on? Like I'm not muted. No, oh, there you are. I'm not okay. muted though. Like it's not yeah. muted. Just couldn't hear you. Yes. Okay. It's yes. Um, okay. It's carried. Someone okay, so I carry the meeting in about five minutes because I'm gone in five minutes. So if we if this goes on longer, then I'll have to pass the meeting over to somebody else. So I guess the, the reason Councillor Kushner and I wanted to bring this forward is that the uh, scope of work that's uh, for the reconstruction of South Drive in uh, Highland is including the installation of new sidewalks that have, haven't existed for 50 years. And I, I think when the actual notice went out, people just interpreted that it was uh, redoing the existing sidewalk. So what's happening now is that there's certain areas on South Drive from uh, Rock Cliff or Rockwood all the way to Cliff Road where the whole west side will be more or less having your driveways cut in half. So that will increase parking on the, uh, on the road as well. And there's certain parts of Highland where the same things are gonna happen. So the neighbors have put together a petition. They want that aspect deleted. And Councillor Kushner and I were talking about it, and maybe there's an opportunity here to take the savings of deleting the sidewalks and apply it to the deficit that we're going to have during this COVID thing. So I was hoping that we could get uh, council support to remove this. It's There's been a school in that neighborhood that closed in 2014, but since 1929, and there's never been any accidents on the road. There's connecting links on either side of the road. So I'm pretty sure people can survive without sidewalks. I totally understand the concept of new new developments, but this is not a new development that's going to impact people negatively. So maybe Councillor Kushner can pipe in a little bit. Hey, Councillor Kushner, are you gonna jump in? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I would make a comment to the effect that I contacted the contractor, uh, Danny O'Hara, 
and uh, he wow. said he's satisfied with uh, any decision that council makes. Thank you. Bye. Okay, I'm just going to stand up for a minute here. Um, to the CAO, is is that a normal course of action that a councillor should be taking, contacting the contractor? No, it, we wouldn't. We advise very stringently against councillors contacting our contractors. That it shouldn't. This should not happen. Mr. Mayor, can you hear me? I can, yeah. yeah. Mr. Mayor? Yep. Yes, if I can, I suggested to staff that uh, they contacted the contractor. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, that did not. Okay, so the comment there that was cut out that he had recommended staff contact the contractor, but. Okay, just for a reminder for counselors, it's a very slippery slope when you start to inject yourself into a project and, and looking to see if there's ways of, of cost cutting. It, it is, I'm just, it, it, could, it could land you in, in, into, the, into some hot water. So just be cognizant of that moving forward. Please. Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, I did not say anything to him. I did not give, try and give him directive. I merely asked the question, thank you. Correct. Uh, Councillor Porter? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The reason I voted against re, um, considering this right now is, I mean, we've heard from the Accessibility Committee and the chair of that committee, I believe, many times on sidewalks, and there's, like, there'd be no opportunity to listen to um, the Accessibility, and I believe that the Accessibility Committee would have a lot to say about this. I, I can't support this. I understand that neighbors get together and they sign petitions and it's, it represents a change to their neighborhood. Um, that neighborhood was built 50 years ago. It was built when we were building cities for cars and not for pedestrians and cyclists and people. Um, and every time we get an opportunity to put a sidewalk in a neighborhood, I am gonna support that um, for many reasons. Um, the first one is we did declare a climate emergency. And one of the simplest things we can do is whenever we can get a um, developer to put in a sidewalk, we can put in a sidewalk. Um, it's, it's very important especially uh, going forward uh, in this crisis, I don't think it's a good idea to, to take out a sidewalk to save costs. And I also believe that the project's gone so far down the road. Um, and our job as counselors is to represent the, the public interest. Um, and sometimes it, you'll get a petition from a neighborhood um, on something, but their, their position is really not in the public interest. Um, accessibility, sidewalks, walkable city, that isn't, that's for the greater public good. And I believe that's my job as a counselor. I don't mean to go off on a soapbox on this, but th this will probably always be my, con my position when it comes to sidewalks. Um, I will always be in favor of them. So I'll get off my soapbox now. Thank you, Councillor Porter. Councillor Littleton. Sorry, I just have a question. Are there sidewalks on the other side? Like, I don't understand why, uh, is there a drawing or something that I can look at this? Because are, are there no sidewalks there just where the school is and they want to put sidewalks there? Or you're saying it's going all the way down and like, I don't understand. Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, South Drive currently does have sidewalks on both the east and west side of the street uh, commencing at Westchester. However, uh, the sidewalks do stop uh, on the west side. They stop just past Ro uh, Rockcliffe Road and on the east side, uh, they stop at Edgedale. So we are just filling in a, a missing section of sidewalk uh, to uh, complete the connection to Cliff Road. So how many people are affected here? Like, I don't, I don't understand. Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, without counting uh, exactly the number of residents, but I believe it's about 20 residents that are affected by, by the installation of these sidewalks. And so right now this is connecting. So like, let's say Bob, Mary and Joe have sidewalks and then there's no sidewalks for a few people and then there's sidewalks again. Sorry, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, no, the, the sidewalks from Westchester on South Drive uh, are 
are complete all the way down to approximately Rock Cliff Road. And then between Rock Cliff and Cliff, there are no sidewalks on the east side. On the, I mean, sorry, on the west side. On the east side, uh, there's no sidewalks for one block, and that is between Edgedale and Cliff Road. So on one side, it's missing two and a half blocks. The other side is missing about one block. And I, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't understand this at all. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Okay, uh, right. Councilor Parento, you're next. And th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, to the Director Bertuccio, um, what's the timeline on this? How much time, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Director, how, how much time do you have to make this decision as to whether or not these sidewalks uh, have to go in or not go in? To you, Mr. Mayor, the contractor is required to carry out uh, the project in accordance with the contract documents, and currently the contract documents include sidewalks. So not uh, if we if we eliminate them, we have to issue a purchase order. And if if we delay him and uh, stop him from being able to uh, carry out work efficiently, there may be potential costs as a result of delays. So, Mr. Mayor, to the director. So what's the timeline on this director? Can you tell us? Like, is it a week? Is it a month? Uh, what is it? Please. Uh, I, through you, Mr. Mayor, as mentioned previously, the contractor has already started construction on South Drive and is uh, already currently on hold. So um, it would it would be our preference that we provide him direction as soon as possible. Mr. Mayor, my question is to Councillor Kushner. How, how long have you been aware of this issue? Uh, and there was mention that there was a petition that had gone around. So I've got to believe, and I'm just guessing, like, when did you become aware of this issue? Can you tell us, please? Back, please. Within the last two weeks, the job was wet uh, last two weeks and people got noticed that their sidewalks were going to be replaced. I believe a lot of the residents didn't pay attention to that. They just assumed the existing sidewalks were being replaced. And then once they realized most of their driveways on the west side on South Drive were going to be eliminated, their single car drives. So we're more or less going to cut them in half. That's when people started to complain. I haven't seen the petition, and I doubt Councillor Kushner's seen it, but uh, we've received numerous calls over the last three or four days. Okay, so so the question is, how, you just said that that it, it goes back two weeks. So my my question is this, and I'm in kind of in the same camp as Councillor Littleton. Um, you know, why weren't we made aware of this? sooner so that we could have researched it and that we could have taken a position on it. And, that, and that, that's directed to, to either you or to Councillor Kushner. Well, maybe I'll take a, a stab at that. The job, the actual physical job, and maybe Anthony can comment on that. We were holding up some capital projects, so it wasn't let, like maybe Anthony can answer that question a little bit clearer. Yes, through, through you, Mr. Mayor, the, this was one of the projects that were, was put on hold as a result of the COVID pandemic and uh, was not considered a critical project. Uh, therefore, it, it was just, uh, just recently started uh, approximately two, three weeks ago uh, as, as the new provincial order came out. Okay, so Mr. Mayor, let, let me just ask to, to the director, what would happen if we put this on hold for, I don't know, another week and then we met specifically for, for a meeting? Like, would it delay the project? I know that Mr. O'Hara has a great relationship with the city. The issue that I have is that I have virtually no research, okay, nothing. And to be honest, I have to be consistent. I laid out some other people before making, making these motions without giving us notice. So I just have to say that for the record, okay? It was the will of council to go to, to waive the rules and a number of us have no research to go on. So can we get a little leeway here? Can we meet halfway? Can like, can you give us three days or four days and then we can reconvene electronically simply for, for one, uh, you know, for one meeting so that, you know, we can make it, at least I can make an informed decision and with the greatest respect to my colleagues so they can make an informed decision. What would happen if we held it up for a week? 
And Mr. O'Hare is a, is a is a great citizen. I think we've got a good relationship. So we don't, talk about the, we don't have to talk about the person who's doing the construction. I beg your pardon. I, I, I retract that. No disrespect. No disrespect. Okay. Um, we got to move on, folks. Uh, Councillor Miller, can I go on to you? Yeah, sorry. I'd, sorry, I had to pop up to put my kids to sleep there for a sec, so hopefully I didn't miss this. But just what, to, to Director to Mark Anthony, why was the, why were these sidewalks originally included in the plan? Like, what was the thinking or rationale there? To you, Mr. Mayor, we, in accordance with our official plan and AODA standards, we always include sidewalks on any reconstruction projects where they are deemed feasible. And uh, this is one of those situations where uh, it was determined and designed it's feasible to have sidewalks on both sides of the street. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Who else do we have here? This is it. Okay. So the motion on the floor is what? Evan? Okay. Uh, Councillor Councillor Kushner seconding it. Yes. So uh, clarification, Mr. Mayor. Yep. Um, with respect to Councillor Sorrento's comment uh, that he needs more information. Could we defer this for a week or for a couple of days, whatever it takes? Someone else will have to make that. Like I, I, we got the information in front of us, but um, someone else has to make that deferral notice. Motion to defer, Mr. Mayor. Uh, who was that? Councilor Townsend. Okay, motion to defer. And so defer until the next meeting or what are we deferring till? No, Councilor. Uh, I Go ahead. I just think that like we've, it's been put out on here. Um, I would like to have some more information on this before making this decision, especially seeing that there is sidewalks right now on both sides of the street. So making the deferral till until next week. So that means we'll have a special meeting of council? No, next council meeting, next council meeting. Deferred on next council. That is, that is two and a half weeks away. Can you get Anthony to comment on that again? Do we have two and a half weeks? To you, Mr. Mayor, uh, we we can uh, we can try to provide some direction to the contractor. Again, it uh, there is the potential for delay costs, um, and and that is not within uh, that is not within our control as he's to execute the work in accordance with contract documents. Okay, um, Mr. Like Mayor, can I suggest three days? Okay, so we're we're trying to do something like it. Councillor Townsend has asked for a deferral. You're now asking for three days and what? Reconvene a meeting? Reconvene on Monday for half an hour. It's up to the will of council. Like I, it's it's. But then, don't you have to do a motion for a special council meeting? Yeah. As well. Yeah, they got to provide notice. So the other thing is, and just in context, we we have a policy, right? The policies. This is what staff are responding to is the policy. So like we, we old coach road, we did the same thing. We, we voted to put in the sidewalks when people didn't want it. And so it's a policy of the city. If we want to change the policy, change the policy. But if we do these one offs, we're effectively saying the policy doesn't matter. So to staff, you shouldn't follow the policy. Well, that, that's not what we're saying, Mr. Mayor. We're saying that the policy has to be interpreted this is a very old neighborhood, one of the oldest in the cities. It's certainly walkable, and the neighbors should certainly have the ability to make their input to council. <laughs> Again, it's a policy that we have. It's, it's, whether it's a 100-year-old subdivision or a new one, it's a policy that council approved. So we have to change the policy moving forward, but we're not going to be able to change that right now. That being said, we've got a motion to defer who wants to have a who wants to have a special meeting? Show of hands. Okay. One, two, three. We got three three people with a special meeting, so we're not having a special meeting. <laughs> so we can defer this until the next meeting of council, which will be on uh, June twenty second. And um, Mr. Martuccio will work with the contractor to uh, try and address any issues of delay. Um, but that's the only time we're, we're making a decision, folks. 
and I would ask everyone bone up on the policy because the policy is what's guiding staff right now. We got to, we got to do the motion to defer first. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Motion to defer. So all in favor of the deferral, hands up, hands on the screen. How many do we have to the clerk? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We got eight for the deferral in terms of hands up that I see. Okay. Opposed? <laughs> uh, so we got Greg. Yeah, so we know we have some people are opposed, which is, I, I'm joining you on the frustration, folks. This is, we have a policy. We got to keep following the policy, but let's have a discussion at the next council meeting on this issue. Okay, Councilor Townsend, uh, do you want to do this note, another notice of motion or just let this one go or? Uh, I'm going to leave the, the first one there, but the budget standing committee, the other one, the other one can be uh, struck. Okay. And that's all. And you'll speak to that one at the next meeting. You got it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, if you can speak to the clerks about that one too, because they, they've got some information that they could provide as well. Thank you. Okay. And then I think that's it for that. Um, report requests. We don't have any. Uh, can we skip the ABCs? In terms of uh, report updates, it's already eight or eight fifteen. I, if not, I'm I'm going to take off. Someone else can take the take the reins here. Okay. okay. Then let's go to the last part, which is the reading of the of the bylaws. Uh, that council bylaws and the council agenda A through D be read a first time, considered and passed. They be signed and executed by the city mayor. Councilor Srentz, are you moving this? Yes. So moved, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Townsend's seconding it. Okay. Yes. All in favor, show of hands. That's carried. Additional reading of the bylaw. Uh, bylaw to amend bylaw 2037, titled a bylaw to temporary waive certain fees, penalties, and charges to the Corporation of St. Catharines. One reading with respect to the 2020 water wastewater rate increase being further deferred from July 1st, 2020 to August 1st, 2020. Be considered the general committee. June 3rd, 2020. So that's been signed and executed. A motion by Councillor Sorrento. So moved, Mr. Mayor. Seconded by Councillor Townsend. And all in favor. Okay, so that's carried. Thank you. And um, looks like I'm on to the last one. Motion to adjourn. Uh, there being no further business items, this being be adjourned. Councillor Kushner's moving this. Councillor Harris, are you still on? Nope. Uh, Councillor Miller, can you second it? Okay, thank you. All in favor of adjournment. Thank you for a great meeting, folks. It was a tough meeting. Good we night, had to get Mayor. a lot done. So I apologize for rushing through some of the stuff, but we had to get a lot done. So thank you very much. Take care. Thank you, Stacey.